Next, a hearing on the United Nations Oil for Food program. A House Government Reform Subcommittee today examined the operation and management of the program in Iraq. This is just under four and a half hours. A quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats and International Relations hearing entitled The UN Oil for Food Program, Cash Cow Meets Paper Tiger is called to order. The United Nations Oil for Food program was mugged by Saddam Hussein. Through cynical yet subtle manipulation, he and an undeclared coalition of the venal on the Security Council exploited structural flaws in the program and institutional naivete at the UN to transform a massive humanitarian aid effort into a multi-billion dollar sanctions-busting scam. How did it happen? How was a well-intentioned program designed and administered by the world's preeminent multinational organization so systematically and so thoroughly corrupted? The answers emerging from our investigation point to a debilitating combination of political paralysis and a lack of oversight capacity allowed to metastasize behind a veil of official secrecy acceding to shameless assertions of Iraqi sovereignty, sovereignty already betrayed by Saddam's brutal willingness to starve the Iraqi people. The UN gave the Hussein regime control over critical aspects of the program. Saddam decided with whom to do business and on what terms. While Chinese, French, and Russian delegates to the Security Council Sanctions Committee deftly tabled persistent reports of abuses, the contractors hired to finance and monitor the program had on only limited authority to enforce safeguards. We will hear from these co contractors today. BNB Paribas, the international bank retained by the UN to finance oil and commodity transactions through letters of credit, describes its functions as purely non-discretionary. Sabolt International, responsible for verifying oil shipments, faced physical and political constraints on performance of their work. And the firm Kotechna Inspection was given only a limited technical role in authenticating shipments of humanitarian goods into Iraq. The UN appears to have assumed the rigor of commercial trade practices would protect the program, while the contractors took false comfort in the assumption the UN would assure the integrity of this decidedly non-commercial enterprise. Once it became clear the Security Council was politically unable to police the program, no one had any incentive to strengthen oversight mechanisms that would only be ignored. As this and other investigations got underway, the companies expressed a willingness to provide detailed information on their oil for food activities, but confidentiality provisions in UN ag agreements prevented their coming forward until the committee's friendly subpoenas trumped those contractual restraints. Since then, they have provided thousands of pages and gigabytes of data, which we and other committees are reviewing. Today, we are releasing some of those documents because apart from any findings or recommendations we might adopt, a major goal of this investigation is to bring transparency to secretive UN processes and to put information about this highly important international program in the public domain. The documents provide the first detailed glimpse into the structural vulnerabilities and operational weaknesses exploited by Saddam and his allies. From what we have learned thus far, one conclusion seems inescapable. The UN sanctions regime against Iraq was all but eviscerated, turned inside out by political manipulation and financial greed. Saddam's regime was not collapsing from within. It was thriving. 
He was not safely contained, as some contend, but was daily gaining the means to threaten regional and global stability again once sanctions were removed. Testimony from our witnesses today will contribute significantly to our ongoing oversight and to the public understanding of the UN United Nations Oil for Food Program. We sincerely thank them for their participation today, and we look forward to their continued cooperation in our work. At this time, the chair would um, recognize the, the full chairman of, uh, excuse me, the full ranking member of the committee, Mr. Waxman, who is an ex officio member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, the committee is holding its uh, fifth congressional hearing to investigate allegations of mismanagement in the UN Oil for Food program. This humanitarian effort was established in 1995 to provide for the basic needs of Iraqis while UN sanctions were in effect. Recently, there have been serious allegations of corruption, overpricing, and kickbacks under this program. And I want to make it clear that I believe it is appropriate for Congress to investigate these allegations in an even-handed manner and follow the evidence wherever it leads. My complaint is that our scope is too narrow. If we're going to look at how Iraq's oil proceeds have been managed, we have an obligation to examine not only the actions of the UN, but also our own actions. In fact, I would argue that our first priority should be to investigate our own conduct. The United States controlled Iraq's oil proceeds from the fall of Baghdad in May 2003 until June 2004. Yet Congress has not held a single hearing to the examine the evidence of corruption, overpricing, and lack of transparency in the successor to the Oil for Food program, the Development Fund for Iraq, which was run by the Bush administration when the United States exercised sovereignty over Iraq. Here are the facts. When the Bush administration took over in Iraq, it received $20.6 billion through Iraqi oil proceeds, repatri repatriated funds, and foreign donations. Halliburton was the single largest private recipient of these funds, receiving $1.5 billion under its contract to run Iraq's oil fields. This money belongs to the Iraqi people. It is not a slush fund. The Security Council directed the administration to use these funds in a transparent manner for the benefit of the Iraqi people. The Security Council passed Resolution 1483, which set up the International Advisory and Monitoring Board to make sure the Bush administration lived up to its obligations. But the Bush administration has not complied with this resolution. Reports from auditors at KPMG, an independent certified public accounting firm, as well as the Coalition Provisional Authority's own Inspector General, have found that the Bush administration failed to properly account for Iraqi funds. KPMG said the Bush administration had inadequate accounting systems, inadequate record keeping, and inadequate controls over Iraqi oil proceeds. It reported that the administration's entire accounting system consisted of only one contractor maintaining Excel spreadsheets. That's one person for $20 billion. Likewise, the Inspector General concluded that the Bush administration had no effective contract review, tracking, and monitoring system, and that it failed to demonstrate the transparency required. These actions merit a full congressional investigation. They are compounded by evidence that the Bush administration is now actively blocking efforts to account for these funds. For six months, the Bush administration has been withholding documents from international auditors charged by the Security Council to oversee the administration's actions. In particular, the Bush administration is withholding documents about Halliburton's receipt of $1.5 billion in Iraq, Iraqi oil proceeds. The auditors have made seven distinct requests for this information, including a letter from the controller of the United Nations directly to Ambassador Bremer. 
but the administration has repeatedly refused to provide the documents and continues to do so today. Three months ago, the international auditors ordered a special audit of the contract with Halliburton, but again, the Bush administration has obstructed their work. Administration officials have refused to approve the auditor's statement of work and refused to issue a request for proposal. The special audit has simply languished inside the Department of Defense. Well, at this committee's previous hearing, Mr. Claude Hankes, Hankes uh, Drilsma, an advisor to the Iraqi Governing Council, testified that the Bush administration was not properly accounting for Iraqi funds. Ambassador Kennedy, who is here again today, could not explain why the Bush administration failed to follow its own rules and hire an accounting firm to manage Iraqi oil proceeds. And the administration failed to adequately respond to the questions for the record we sent jointly regarding the DFI. Well, these actions are hypocritical, they're arrogant, they breed resentment in the Arab world, and they further deteriorate our global alliances. But most of all, they undermine our efforts in Iraq because they reinforce the image that our primary objective in Iraq was to seize control of the country's oil wealth. If we're going to examine how Iraq's oil money has been sent, which I believe we should, we need to proceed in a fair and transparent way. And if we refuse to ask tough questions about the conduct of our own government officials, our efforts will have little credibility in the eyes of the world. After the opening statements today, I'm going to make a motion for subpoenas so that we can continue the investigation of the, uh, of the, uh, the successor for the UN Oil for Food program, which was run by the US. I'm going to ask for subpoenas, which we asked for, by the way, when subpoenas were issued for this investigation. We asked for subpoenas on the same, re on the same basis, that uh, we needed a subpoena for example, for the, um, uh, d uh, for, uh, the corporate banking operations of BNP Paribas to give us the documents which the chairman is going to make public today. Those documents would not be turned over without a subpoena. Documents will not be turned over to us from uh, the uh, Nas Federal Reserve Bank uh, on the same basis. We need a subpoena to get it. We need further subpoenas as well, and I'll be making a motion for both subpoenas to be uh, issued so that uh, while we have our hearing today, we can be prepared to do the full investigation of what happened to the oil money after we took over. We want to know what happened when the UN was running it, if there was corruption, if there was fraud, if there was a lack of transparency. But we have a special obligation to know what happened to that money when we took it over, if there was corruption, if there fr was fraud, if there was a lack of transparency. And so far, the Bush administration is refusing to help in this investigation to know what happened after they ran those funds. So I, I know, Mr. Chairman, we're going to have the opening statements from the members first. Before we then proceed to the uh, first witness, I'll make my motion for subpoenas. And as I understand it, you're going to ask that that uh, vote uh, be held uh, later in the, after the witnesses have testified, uh, presumably because we've done too good a job of getting the Democrats <laughs> here to vote. And, the Republicans, unaware that their vote would be taking place, uh, are not here in uh, sufficient numbers. I understand that's in the chairman's discretion, uh, but I want to vote. If it's a bipartisan, if it's a bipartisan vote, uh, that would be great. I think we ought to have a bipartisan vote to get these subpoenas. If it's a partisan vote, well, I think the American people ought to know that the Republicans are going to vote to stop a, a real investigation of the uh, actions of the Bush administration with regard to the use of those funds, and particularly because of the Halliburton involvement. Thank I thank the gentleman. I also thank him for letting me know that uh, he was going to make this motion, but I had not uh, known in time to tell um, our members this is a hearing, and I, didn't think, I don't think they thought there'd be votes. So I appreciate his one letting us know. Uh, at this time, the chair would recognize uh, the vice chairman, uh, Michael Turner. Thank you, Chairman Shays, for holding this hearing and for continuing your efforts uh, to continue to examine the Oil for Food program. Um, in our first hearing, we explored the accountability and integrity issues with the program. Uh, we discovered a lack of transparency and little accountability. 
It's ex except for the actions of the United States and the United Kingdom, it appears that no one was bringing to light the corruption in the program. The Oil for Food program at its creation was poised for corruption. The UN allowed Iraq to select not only the suppliers of food and medicine, but also the buyers of Iraqi oil. The mechanisms established by the UN for controlling oil for food contracts were inadequate, transparency was non-existent, and effective internal review of the program did not occur. We do not know if members of the Security Council were involved in any of the cor corruption, but enough ancillary information exists to question the objectiveness and credibility of the Security Council and of the United Nations. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your continued leadership on this important issue. And I appreciate your continued leadership in the issue of um, our continued involvement in, in Iraq and its transition to democracy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. At this time, the chair would recognize uh, Mr. Tierney. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I share your concern about the diversion of Iraqi oil proceeds through graft, kickbacks, and other schemes designed to line the pockets of corrupt Iraqi leaders. If I may, I'd like to read an account about the corruption that occurred in Iraq under the management previously in charge. Mr. Saad Abdul Qassam was the Iraqi official in charge of withdrawals at the Iraq Central Bank. He reported that there was no need to rob the bank in a daring heist with guns and masks because the bank was robbed every day by the directors of the Iraqi ministries. According to Mr. Qassam, they use up all the money they want to withdraw. If it's a big amount, they can get it in big bags. If it's a small amount, they get it in a box. But the directors general are those people who are withdrawing the money. They can take the money immediately from the bank and put it in their pockets. Mr. Chairman, I regret to say that this didn't happen under the Oil for Food program. It happened under the Development Fund for Iraq. When I mentioned the previous management, I was talking about this country's, the United States' administration. The account was from an NPR series called Spoils of War, and it highlights just how dysfunctional the Bush administration's management of DFI funds actually was. There was virtually no monitoring of what happened to Iraqi funds once they left the hands of this administration's officials. Indeed, according to the Wall Street Journal article published on September 17th, the Coalition Provisional Authority's own Inspector General has now completed a report finding that the Bush administration, and I quote, hasn't demonstrated it kept much control over any of the assets it seized following the war. In particular, the IG study reportedly concludes that the Bush administration failed to account for $8.8 .8 billion in DFI funds that were transferred to Iraqi ministries. According to the Journal report, the occupation government was unable to say for sure whether the money it dispersed was spent properly or even spent at all. It's amazing that we have held hearing after hearing about the United Nations management of the Oil for Food program, which I agree we should. I think you're on the right track and that's necessary. But we've not held even one hearing on this administration's mismanagement of Iraqi oil proceeds, and I agree with Mr. Waxman that that is equally as important to the credibility of this country if we're going to really look at this situation and have the respect of the world knowing that we're trying to be transparent and get to the bottom of how these monies were expended. How can we expect the rest of the world to follow this administration's example? How can we expect them to comply with so Security Council resolutions when the Bush administration ignores them? Mr. Chairman, we do no service to the administration by allowing them to proceed in this manner. I urge the committee to immediately address these issues and exercise meaningful oversight, as well as continue our hearing process on the UN Food for Oil program. But we must be resolute about all of the improprieties or, or lapses. Thank you. I yield back. I, I thank the gentleman. At this time, the chair would recognize Mr. Duncan. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. A few years ago, uh, 60 Minutes did a report uh, on the scandals, uh, the scandals, uh, the scandalously high level of waste, uh, fraud, and abuse uh, occurring at the United Nations, uh, much of it with American money, uh, but this oil for food program scandal really uh, takes the cake. And, I, and so I appreciate very much your uh, continuing to look into the, this situation and hold these uh, hearings. Uh, through this program, Saddam Hussein obtained 10.1 billion dollars in illegal revenues. I remember uh, <coughs> hearing a talk a few months ago by Charlie Cook, the very respected political analyst, and he said that people really can't comprehend uh, a figure over a, a billion dollars. And, and it is difficult to think of how much money $10.1 billion is. This money was uh, mostly squandered on Hussein's uh, palaces, luxury cars, and lavish uh, lifestyle that he and his family were uh, living. This uh, theft was made possible apparently by uh, surcharges, illegal kickbacks, and abuse by UN personnel and by 
a lackadaisical and inept uh, attitude of, uh, and greedy attitude, really, of some of the companies um, involved that we'll hear from uh, today. The Wall Street uh, Journal reported uh, in, an, in an article and said, uh, in, a, in an editorial wrote, and oh, what a lot of business the UN did. Mr. Anand, uh, Kofi Annan's uh, secretariat and his staff collected more than 1.4 billion in commissions on these uh, sales. Uh, but during this time, the UN uh, uh, was doing almost nothing to really push uh, uh, weapons inspections and other things that they should have been doing in Iraq. The UN uh, Oil for Food program was the largest humanitarian effort in UN history. Unfortunately, it has now become the shining example of everything that is wrong with this organization. The United States pays one-fourth of the operating expenses of the United Nations one-third of the money to uh, many of the uh, other UN programs and uh, mostly uh, are uh, as much as 90 or 95 percent on most of the UN peacekeeping operation. If the UN cannot provide any better oversight than what we see through this program, then uh, surely our tax dollars uh, can be spent uh, better elsewhere, particularly at a time when we have a seven and a half trillion dollars na uh, national debt and uh, deficits uh, running in the four to five hundred billion dollar range. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the, the, the gentleman and the chair at this time would recognize uh, Ms. Watson. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I think it's critical for Congress to address the serious questions surrounding the Bush administration's deficit management of Iraqi oil proceeds and other funds in the development fund for Iraq. We made a commitment to the Iraqi people, a promise that we would spend their money for their benefit and we do have to remember that it is their money. We also promised to spend it in a transparent manner so the entire world would know that we were managing their funds properly and are not allowing graft corruption and mismanagement to infiltrate our mission there. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, it appears that the Bush administration has failed to live up to these commitments. Auditors at the CPA's own Inspector General's office have issued a report that is extremely critical of the administration's management of Iraqi funds in the development fund for Iraq. In particular, the Inspector General's report criticizes actions by the administration's contracting activity office in Iraq. If I may, I'd like to read just a, a short portion of the report. The CPA contracting activity had not issued standard operating procedures or developed an effective contract review, tracking, and monitoring system. In addition, contract files were missing or incomplete. Further, contracting officers did not always ensure that contract prices were fair, reasonable. Contractors were capable of meeting delivery schedules and payments were made in accordance with contract requirements. This occurred because the CPA contracting activity did not provide adequate administrative oversight and technical supervision over the contracting actions completed by procuring contracting officers as required. As a result, the CPA contracting activity was not accurately reporting the number of contracts actually awarded by the CPA contracting activity. This hindered the CPA contracting activities ability to demonstrate the transparency required of the CPA when it awarded contracts using DFI funds. Mr. Chairman, this is an indictment of the administration's entire management approach to the funds of the Iraqi people. The Inspector General went on to warn that because contract files were not adequately maintained, they could not be relied upon to ensure compliance are to be used as a source for congressional reporting. How are we in Congress supposed to be able to conduct our oversight responsibilities when the information is not reliable? The Inspector General's report found that of the contracts they analyzed, 67 percent had incomplete or missing documentation. 67 percent, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman this is a horrendous record. Finally, the Inspector General provided his fundamental conclusion about the administration's stewardship of these Iraqi funds. The Inspector General reported 
We do not believe that transparency can be achieved when pertinent data is unavailable or inaccurate. Mr. Chairman, this is an embarrassment to our country. The Bush administration has failed to comply with Security Council Resolution 1483, and we need to take action. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the, uh, the gentlelady. Uh, at this time, uh, the chair would recognize Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The focus of today's hearing is really twofold. First, to investigate the structural weaknesses that made the oil for food program vulnerable to diversion and exploitation, and second, to determine the steps oil for food program managers and contractors took to prevent abuse. Now, we could spend all day just on point number one, but sadly, I think the answer is staring us all in the face. The evidence uncovered over the last year by several different investigations casts little doubt that one of the fundamental problems with the UN oil for food program was that the UN was running it, fueled by the greed and complicity of other countries. Despite repeated criticisms and questions of concern, UN member countries and UN personnel continually turned a blind eye to the corruption of a program designed to get humanitarian assistance to the people living under one of the most corrupt regimes in the world. We knew Saddam Hussein was corrupt and his tactics of ruthless violence were a way of life. One would think the UN would be aware of this and structure the program in such a way so as to guard against it. One would think that attempts by Hussein to evade the sanctions through this program would be anticipated and thus steps taken to counter his money-making scheme from the beginning rather than trying to put out fires after the fact. Rather, it appears as if the oil for food program went out of its way to encourage scandal and the illicit use of humanitarian contracts to line the pockets of Saddam Hussein and his cronies. Now, the United States gave millions in lives to France in World War I, World War II, and Vietnam. Yet they turned their backs on us when faced with Hussein's ever-increasing threat to the international community. France and Russia had two choices. Help us militarily or intervene directly with Saddam Hussein to cooperate with weapons inspectors and stop his murderous regime. They did neither. Why didn't these countries step forward? Perhaps it had something to do with the fact that evidence suggests Russia was the recipient of 1.366 billion barrels of oil through Hussein's voucher scheme, and French companies close to President Chirac also benefited from Saddam's power. They were up to their ears in corruption, and the financial benefit of keeping Saddam Hussein in power weighed more heavily than their friendship with the United States. Corruption in the oil for food program enriched Hussein to the tune of $10.1 billion, enough to buy and build more weapons, more clandestine activity, and further undermine the entire UN sanctions program. There is one line in the subcommittee's background memo that really sums up the problem with the program. Quote, oil for food program was essentially run by Saddam Hussein, unquote. How is it that the UN could allow the terms of a program meant to punish a tyrannical leader while offering assistance to the very people that suffered under him to be dictated by that very tyrant? It is because the current nature of the UN is to be soft on terrorism and the world leaders that support it. The spineless UN produced paper tigers in the form of resolutions that had no teeth. Time and again, the UN told Saddam Hussein and terrorists that the UN was all talk and no follow through. And the world has reaped the grim harvest of that approach. More terrorists, more terrorists emboldened by the UN's weaknesses. According to classified documents reviewed by the subcommittee, the UN created and encouraged an environment whereby Russia, France, China, and Syria, all nations standing to gain financially by the continued support of Saddam's government, continually blocked efforts by the US and the United Kingdom to maintain the integrity of the oil for food program. And all of those countries sat on the UN Security Council. The contractors responsible for inspecting shipments coming in and out of Iraq were also under, undermined by the UN Oil for Food Program policies. If the obstacles by Iraqi personnel were not enough, the UN denied the contractors the staff and the authority necessary to enforce inspection standards. One example given was an instance in which Sabolt was unable to prevent the transfer of oil onto a ship with expired letters of credit. If the inspectors had no enforcement powers, why have inspectors at all? Now, some may question why Congress is so interested in this issue. Our interest in the UN's involvement in Iraq goes far beyond the oil for food program. As the United States continues to fight terrorists in Iraq, our level of cooperation with the UN has been called into question. Yet, 
if France and Russia and the UN knowingly undermine the mission of the Oil for Food program and knowingly undermine the efforts to stop Saddam Hussein, this Congress has a responsibility to ask who our allies are and who the UN is supporting. When some critics of the Iraq war claim our actions did not pass a global test, we must remember what interests the global community truly values. As I said before, we have given the French millions of our soldiers' lives, and they have given us the cold shoulder. France has repeatedly turned to us for help. In response, they have turned their back on us. The oil for food corruption scandal may be the answer of why. When the United States continues to foot the bill for UN peacekeeping missions, the UN is unwilling to support us in our efforts to protect our own citizens. And for winning the approval of these European countries of the UN for US policy is the global test, maybe we should reconsider and question the reliability and supposed altruism of those sitting in judgment. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. At this time, the chair would recognize the distinguished gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Sanders. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't think there is any disagreement on this committee about the importance of investigating the UN Oil for Food program. It is important to know how American dollars being contributed to the UN were spent uh, and how the corrupt Saddam Hussein regime ended up stealing money that should have gone to hungry people in Iraq. So I have no objection about investigating that important issue. But I think it is equally important not only that we investigate what the UN does with American taxpayer money, it is equally important to investigate what the Bush administration and the United States government does with American taxpayer monies. You know, Mr. Chairman, I have been on this committee uh, for uh, more than a few years. And I can recall very clearly that during the Clinton administration, this committee held dozens upon dozens of hearings to investigate every single allegation relating to the Clinton administration, no matter how off the wall those allegations were. We investigated the Vince Foster suicide. We investigated Monica Lewinsky, so-called Travelgate, Whitewater, Ad Infinitum, on and on and on. However, rather amazingly, during the Bush administration, this committee has not held one substantive hearing to investigate any serious allegation against the Bush administration. And why is that important? It is important because we have a Republican administration, we have a Republican Senate, we have a Republican House. And it is the moral obligation under the Constitution of the United States that the Congress provides oversight onto any administration. Otherwise, the government doesn't work. Yeah, it's easy to beat up an administration from another party. We all know that. But we, as members of Congress, have the responsibility to take a hard look at what any administration does, regardless of what party they are. And all over this country, I think there is a growing concern that the United States Congress has abdicated its oversight responsibility. All over America, people are asking, why did we, in fact, go to war? And I know there are two sides to the issue. This committee hasn't looked at the rationale for going to war in Iraq. We haven't looked at the leak of the names of CIA agents. We haven't looked at the fact that the Medicare, that the Medicare office uh, was threatened, actuary, the Medicare actuary was threatened with being fired if he actually told members of Congress the truth about how much money the prescription drug program would cost. We haven't taken a look at the Cheney Energy Task Force. And especially when we come to issues like Halliburton, we have a double responsibility. Everybody here knows that the Vice President of the United States used to be the CEO of Halliburton. Now, I am not casting any aspersions on what has happened. But all over this country, people want to know, did Halliburton get a special deal? How come they got no bid contracts? How come billions of dollars went to Halliburton? Now, how come we are not looking at that issue? So, Mr. Chairman, what I would simply say is, yeah, let's take a hard look at what the UN did. And while I know it's easy to beat up on France and Germany, it might be a little bit more difficult but maybe of more interest to the American people to take a hard look at what goes on 
understand. At the Bush administration. Okay. I yield back. I thank the gentleman at this time. The, gen uh, the chair would recognize Mr. Lynch from Massachusetts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, believe that there's a, there's a very strong need uh, to carry out a, a thorough investigation in the circumstances. I'd like to focus on, however, with the ambassador's cooperation, the facts that led us to this point. Uh, here we have a, a situation where this oil for food program was established back in 1995 after we had fought the first Gulf War. And it was, it was established specifically because Saddam Hussein had run that country into the ground. He had failed to address the infrastructure needs and the humanitarian needs of his own people. He had used the country's natural resources as his own slush fund. He had used the basic uh, funds that were in the Treasury, the National Treasury, uh, at his own pleasure. He had ignored the basic health and welfare of his citizens in favor of a military buildup. Saddam Hussein waged wars against Iran, uh, invaded Kuwait. He had uh, fired Scud missiles into the citizen population, the civilian populations of Israel. And we fought a war to remove him from power, to remove him from, a, from Kuwait initially. And even with the evidence of his own atrocities and the evidence of, of his uh, corrupt activities between him and his son, squandering the, the wealth of that country and, and uh, abusing its citizens, after the United States took a leadership role in establishing this fund, in deciding who would contract for the Iraqi people with this fund of $20 billion, after that worldwide search, who would, who would negotiate and who would control the terms for the Iraqi people, the responsibility was given to those same people, Saddam Hussein and his, and his thugs, his family, the people that had been abusing that country for the previous 40 years. That was the colossal failure here, that we allowed Saddam Hussein to call the terms of that agreement, and he had the support of some of our international neighbors in getting the most favorable terms, having a private bank handle this. We could not get information under the arrangement that was agreed to between the UN, Kofi Annan, Secretary General, and Saddam Hussein and his regime. How did we ever allow ourselves to be put in this position? How did we allow the victims here? And, and there are three sets of victims. One, the Iraqi people. This was, this was their natural wealth. This was their country, their resources. The American taxpayer footing the bill again. And also the credibility of the United Nations. There are great misgivings here because of what has gone on. There is a definite, I haven't been on this committee that long. I've, I've come to this committee recently. I've been here, this will be almost three years I've been on this committee. But I can tell you there's a definite reluctance to investigate anything on this committee. I'm still waiting after three meetings with, with the Defense Department to get the names of some Halliburton individuals who, who they have removed for, for bribery and, uh, and, and corrupt practices with, with individuals uh, in Iraq and, and in the Middle East on an investigatory committee in the Congress, and we can't get the names of our own people when they have conceded that they were involved in bribery and uh, corrupt practices, in which the, the taxpayers' funds have, have uh, disappeared in the millions. We, we need to do our job here, and I, I believe we will get to it eventually. But uh, there's been tremendous wrongdoing here, and we have to step up to the plate and do what the American people have asked us to do, get to the bottom of this. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I thank the gentleman very much. Ms. Maloney, you're next. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sh Chairman Shays, and, and uh, I thank also uh, Chair uh, Ranking Member Waxman uh, for your holding this important hearing, uh, and welcome, Ambassador Kennedy. It's good to see you again. 
I, I think that uh, we learned a great deal last uh, April at our hearing, but since the appointment of Paul Volcker and the independent inquiry of the Oil for Food program, there is much, much more to understand. I do believe that it is very important that we as a oversight body in Congress look at the UN and their finances, but we must also look at the finances and how we as a government handled the funds. We need to look at that equally. And I have some uh, grave concerns that some of my colleagues have raised today in their testimony of the stewardship of the Iraqi oil proceeds and the successor to the Oil for Food program, uh, the Development Fund for Iraq, uh, which we created. As was mentioned on May 22nd of 2003, after the United States took control of Iraq, the UN Security Council passed Resolution 1483, formally transferring the Oil for Food assets to a new development fund for Iraq and placing them under the authority of the Coalition Provisional Authority, which was headed by Bremer. Resolution 1483 directed the Bush administration to spend these funds on behalf of the Iraqi people. The Security Council also imposed other restrictions. And I think these restrictions are important, and in the testimony today, I want to know why we didn't follow them. And I'll give uh, several examples. The Security Council required the administration to, to, to deposit all oil sale proceeds into the development fund for Iraq, which is held by the Central Bank of Iraq at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. The Security Council required that all deposits to and spending from the Development Fund of Iraq be done, and I quote, in a transparent manner, end quote. And the Security Council required that the administration to ensure that the Development Funds for Iraq funds were used to meet the humanitarian needs of the Iraqi people and for other purposes benefiting the people of Iraq. To ensure that the administration complied with these re requirements, the Security Council created the International Advisory Monitoring Board to oversee these actions, the IAMB Board. The board was envisioned as the primary vehicle for guaranteeing the transparency of Iraqi funds. When the Bush administration assumed responsibility for these funds, it explicitly agreed to these terms. On August 19, 2003, Ambassador Bremer issued a memorandum stating as follows, and I quote, as steward for the Iraqi people, the CPA will manage and spend Iraqi funds which belong to the Iraqi people for their benefit. They shall be managed in a transparent manner that fully comports with the CPA's obligations under international law, including Resolution 1483 of the United Nations. But Mr. Chairman, the administration has not complied with the resolution, and I do not believe that the requirements were very strict. The administration took in, as Mr. Waxman noted, a total of $20.6 billion while it controlled this uh, development fund in Iraq. On July 15th of 2004, the Oversight Board issued its first audit report on the administration's stewardship of Iraqi funds, and this report was conducted by KPMG, which happens to be headquartered in the district I represent, the same international certified public accounting firm reviewing the oil for food program. So we had the same auditor for both programs. KPMG criticized the administration for, and I quote, inadequate accounting systems, inadequate record keeping, inadequate controls over Iraqi oil proceeds. On the most basic level, KPMG found that the administration failed to follow its own policy to hire a certified public accounting firm. According to the KPMG report, the CPA was required to obtain the services of an independent certified public accounting firm to assist in the accounting function of the, of the Development Fund of Iraq. But our administration 
The current administration never did so. In addition, the sum total of the accounting system used by the administration consisted of, and I quote, this is directly out of the KPMG report, quote, Excel spreadsheets and pivot tables maintained by one individual, end quote. The KPMG report con concluded as follows, the CPA senior advisory to the Ministry of Finance, who is also chairman of the Program Review Board, was unable to acknowledge the fair presentation of the statement of cash receipts and payments, the completeness of significant contracts entered into by the DFI, and his responsibilities for the implementation and operations of accounting and internal control systems designed to prevent, detect fraud and error." End quote. I, I, I believe these are very uh, serious findings. They basically say that uh, the United States uh, has failed to comply with the transparency and accountability requirements set forth by the United Nations in the Security Council Resolution 1483. So I, I look forward uh, to uh, the opportunity to question Ambassador Kennedy about these serious uh, problems, uh, truly uh, uh, having uh, accountable and transparency over uh, money is a very important uh, role of government. Uh, we try to do this in our own government, and we certainly uh, should bring the same standards uh, to monies that we oversaw in Iraq. Uh, so again, I, I thank the chairman and the ranking member for their continued oversight. It's important, and I look forward to the opportunity to question Mr. Kennedy. I thank the gentlelady, and at this time, the chair would recognize Mr. Rupert's Sure. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I come to this hearing today with many concerns. My first concern is about the allegations that have been made and the way they're being investigated. There are three main charges that have been levied. Overpricing by the Saddam regime, kickbacks made by the companies contracting with Saddam through the program and what Saddam used that money for, and three, corruption within the UN itself in running the Oil for Food program. These are all very serious allegations, and if any or all of them are proven to be true, those individuals proven to be guilty of illegalities and wrongdoings should be brought to full and complete justice. On that, I believe we can all agree. I have serious concerns about the number of investigations occurring, the leaks to the media, the potential of mishandling valuable evidence and the use of the court of public opinion, uh, the media and others, rather than allowing the Paul Volcker investigation to complete its work. When we last met in April to discuss the same issue, members on both sides of the aisle praised the unprecedented commissioning of an independent investigation by Kofiam uh, Annan and the appointment of Mr. Volcker. Since then, Mr. Volcker has had to assemble a staff, enter into the memorandums of agreement with multiple investigations, assemble and review a decade worth of documents, and all the while answer to UN member states, all with vested interest, including the United That's States, it. and that is no easy task. I'm concerned that the current investigations are being politicized, and the evidence submitted is being leaked before it is ever vetted, authenticated, or corroborated. I'm concerned that this is turning out to be an inductive investigation rather than a, a deductive investigation. And I know that that is the wrong way to conduct a credible investigation. I urge caution as we proceed further. Let's consider a few facts. First, the Oil for Food program is no longer in existence, and therefore the rush to judgment may do more harm than good. Second, Mr. Volcker has promised a full and complete investigation report to member states by mid-2005, and we should allow that investigation to conclude before condemning a report that has yet to be written. Three, third, we are fighting a global war on terrorism that requires international involvement, including the UN, damaging the reputation of any politician, national leader, ally, or international institution at this time, this delicate time, without a full vet vetting of the facts is simply premature and dangerous. We must follow the facts, and I'm glad to see that the chairman has called these witnesses to deal with two of the three main allegations head on. I would hope that the main, that the same will be done with the allegations resting on the al Mada, which is the Iraqi newspaper published list, and all who possess or witness those documents at one time. And I would like to hear from the al Mada editor and chief, from the KPMG, Patton Boggs, Freshfields, Brukhaus Derenger, Paul Bremer, Hans Claude Dreslema, to address those documents, which are the starting point of this scandal. 
I also think it would be useful to bring an authentica authentication expert before this committee to discuss authentication and how it is done and what it means and why it's so important. Ultimately, I think we must allow Mr. Volker to carry out this investigation, to look at the facts and evidence, to look at his conclusions, and then decide as a nation what is our best interest to do next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, gentleman. Um, at this time, uh, I'd like to make unanimous consent that Doug Osi, a member of the full committee and chairman of the Regulatory Affairs Subcommittee, be allowed to participate in this hearing and without objection so ordered. And at this time, I would welcome any statement that Mr. Osi would like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was listening with particular attention to Mr. Ruppersberg's remarks about this being an inductive investigation as opposed to a deductive investigation. Uh, seems like we've had a lot of rhetoric today about, you know, who's guilty and who's not. I just want to go back to a couple of uh, uncontested facts. The Oil for Food program was established in April of 1995, pursuant to UN Security Council Resolution 986. And the food actually started to flow in December of 96. So there was about a year and a half drag between the time it was authorized and the time it was actually implemented. And interestingly enough, that the first known request for any examination of the program in terms of fraud or lack of transparency occurred in the first few days of March of 2001. So for five years, from uh, December of 96, four and a half years, from December of 96 to March of 2001, this program just sailed along without oversight, interest, or monitoring. Pursuant to the request in early March of 2001 that the 661 committee actually look at this issue, in March 7th of 2001, Kofi Annan actually sent a notice to Iraq saying they got to clean up their act. Again, from the time in December of 96 to March of 2001, nobody paid any attention. The perpetrators of this scam set the rules, the UN signed off on it, and the administration turned a blind eye. However, in early March of 2001, that changed. Finally, somebody in the administration did something and brought to the attention of the 661 committee allegations that fraud and lack of transparency were occurring. I think the record needs to be very clear on this issue, that the only time this fraud that was taking place, excuse me, that's inductive, the only time that we finally got around to examining whether fraud was be taking place was in March of 2001. The people who approved the program in the mid-90s turned a blind eye to it. The Security Council, the 661 Committee, they just said, just go do it. Don't bother us with the details. But in March of 2001, somebody finally started asking the hard questions. What changed? I hope we examine that issue. What changed from the mid-90s to March of 2001 so that the questions finally started getting asked? I think that's a central question to this thing. Because you cannot uncover fraud. You cannot reverse years and years of practice by snapping your fingers or standing up here beating your chest. This culture got set up, it got established, it got ignored, and in March 2001, we finally called them on it. Mr. Chairman, I hope we uh, get to the bottom of this. Thank the gentleman. Um, Ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record and the record remain open for three days for that purpose and without objection so ordered. I ask for the unanimous consent that all members be permitted to include their written statement in the record and without objection so ordered. <clears throat> we have a, um, a representative of the French Embassy, but I think first we'll have uh, to just make a statement and maybe leave a document. But I think I'll first ask Mr. Waxman to make his motion and then we'll uh, put that on the table. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, two, two separate motions for subpoenas. The first one is a subpoena under House Rule 11-2-K-6. On July 8th, this committee issued a subpoena to the French bank BNP 
Paribus, which was responsible for maintaining the oil for food es escrow account controlled by the UN. When the committee issued the subpoena, the argument by the chairman and others was that a subpoena was necessary because the bank could not legally cooperate with this committee's inquiries unless it had the legal protection afforded by a subpoena. In other words, they wanted to cooperate, we were told, but they needed to have the subpoena for legal reasons. Mr. Chairman, my subpoena is for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. This is the bank that maintains the development fund for Iraq, which was run by the Bush administration from 2000, May 2003 to June 2004. Just as you asked the French bank for documents relating to the inflow and outflow of funds under the Oil for Food program, we asked for identical documents from the Federal Reserve Bank. In fact, the language in my subpoena tracks the uh, broad language of your subpoena almost word for word, substituting references to the Oil for Food program with refer references to the Development Fund for Iraq. In making this motion, I want the record to reflect that the Federal Reserve Bank has expressed the exact same policy as the French bank with respect to cooperating with this committee. They cannot respond to a simple letter request, but they are more than willing to respond to a friendly subpoena. And I want to submit for the record an email received from the Council and Vice President of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank dated October 4, 2004. It states as follows, with respect to providing DFI account information to the Congress, we concluded that as long as we are acting pursuant to a subpoena, we can provide DFI account information for the period that the DFI was operated by Ambassador Bremer without violating our contractual obligation to the Central Bank of Iraq. So, Mr. Chairman, we have an exactly parallel situation. We are talking about the same funds, the Iraqi oil proceeds, that were supposed to be used for the humanitarian benefit of the Iraqi people. We are talking about the financial institutions responsible for maintaining these funds, and we're talking about serious allegations of mismanagement. The only difference is that the United Nations controlled one set of funds and the Bush administration controlled the other. I believe this committee's legitimacy will be judged by how it treats these two cases. We can choose to treat them equally in an even-handed manner, properly exercising our constitutional oversight responsibilities. Or, uh, Mr. Chairman, you and your colleagues can attempt once again to use procedural machinations to shield the Bush administration from embarrassment and, more importantly, from accountability. And so my first motion is for the committee to issue a subpoena uh, uh, to Mr. Timothy Geithner, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, to produce the documents relating to the Development Fund for Iraq. Uh, and I did ask uh, consent that the email that uh, we received. Without objection, the email will be statement. part of the record. Um, would you like to make your second motion as well? I mean, let me just say that the, the motion, motion, let me first say the motion offered by the gentleman from California is in order under House Rule 11, Clause 2, K6. That rule states the chairman shall receive and the committee shall dispense with request to subpoena additional evidence. Pursuant to that rule, the chairman may determine the timing of the consideration of such request. Uh, at this time, the motion shall be considered as entered and the committee will consider the motion offered by the gentleman from California at 245 today. Would he like to make a, a well, second? Well, I'd be happy to, but is there any, uh, I offered them separately because I can hear, I can see of no opposition to the first one. And if there is somebody who wants to you know, argue in opposition, no, let me, let me just, uh, would you like me to comment on your motion? Pardon? Would you like me to comment on your motion? Uh, it, yeah. Unless you're I, for I, it. I, 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 I believe, the chair will give him, uh, reserves the time to speak. And, um, and just say to you that, uh, uh, conceptually, I think that uh, while I don't uh, agree with with the arguments on why uh, this information is needed uh, and that there is wrongdoing that requires it, I do think that that there is merit uh, in getting this information. And uh, so my interest is getting this information. My my inclination is always to write a letter first. In this instance, a letter may not be. Uh, required with the documentation that you have, and so I want to consider that. Um, and uh, I'll reserve judgment, frankly, on, on that motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that's a reasonable position, and as you think about it uh, between now and 2.30, I, I Two, hope... 2.45. 2.45. Uh, well, I hope at 2.30 you make the decision to support the subpoena and follow through at 2.45. Now, uh, my second uh, 
uh, motion is for a subpoena under House Rule 11 2K6. As I said in my opening statement, the Bush administration has grossly mismanaged Iraqi oil proceeds and other funds and development fund for Iraq. There have been multiple reports about the administration failing to manage these funds in an open, transparent, and accountable man manner as required by the Security Council Resolution 1483. In addition, the administration is now withholding documents from the international auditors charged by the UN Security Council to monitor its stewardship of these funds. And I think a subpoena is necessary at this point because the administration has refused requests to voluntarily turn over this information. Indeed, Mr. Chairman, you issued a press release on June 23 of this year condemning the administration for failing to provide information to this subcommittee regarding both the Oil for Food program and the Development Fund for Iraq. And this is what you said about the administration's reply. The response is incomplete. There is still an insufficient accounting of relevant documents in custody. Several questions and requests are simply unanswered. Well, as you know, the committee still has not received the information re we requested on May 21. After the administration rejected the subcommittee's request for information, I wrote to Congressman Davis, the chairman of the full committee, on July 9, and asked that he subpoena the documents. In my request, I tracked exactly the language and format he used to subpoena the French bank handling the oil for food account. On July 12, Chairman Davis wrote back refusing to issue the subpoena. He said it was premature that he preferred to send a letter requesting the information. Well, I wrote to him again on July 15, attaching a draft letter for him to sign and send out, but he never did. Instead, he just ignored my request entirely. I wrote again on July 29, repeating my request. To this day, he has failed to respond to my multiple requests to do so. Now that these voluntary efforts have failed, it's clear that we have exhausted all our options. We have no choice but to issue a subpoena. So in light of these numerous failures to provide information to the United Nations and the U.S. Congress, I move that this, the committee subpoena uh, witness, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, to produce the specified documents, including records of receipts and disbursements, sole source contracts, and other listed uh, materials. I understand, Mr. Chairman, it's always preferable to send a letter requesting the information, but if we can't even get the chairman of the committee to send a letter requesting it, and uh, we have no response to our letters requesting the information directly from the um, uh, DOD, uh, it seems to me that, um, that we have no, uh, no other course uh, but to go ahead with a subpoena. And uh, to date, we still have not received these documents, so it's clear that we need to move to a subpoena. So I urge support for the subpoena. Thank you, and it, it, we'll, we'll take that up after we discuss the first one, and then I'll reserve judgment as well on this, and we'll have a little dialogue before we have that vote. And uh, we will have a, a five-minute uh, dialogue on each of those subpoenas before and uh, on each side, so there'll be a 10-minute dialogue debate on each of those motions before we vote. Let me um, just say, I think Mr. Lantos is here, and if Mr. Lantos would like to make a statement on, uh, on um, the offer of food hearing beforehand, or we'll get right to our, our uh, hearing. Is there a preference? Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah. The French Embassy has asked if a representative, Ms. Christine Grenet, uh, could provide some information to the subcommittee. And uh, without objection, uh, I would like to uh, recognize her for a brief statement, and that's what we'll do. Thank you. Nice to have you here. Would you Mr. make Chairman. sure that your mic is on and that you move the mic close to you? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, I know that it's our normal practice to swear in our witnesses. No, we're not swearing in. She's not going to, she's just, do, how brief is your statement? It's like a paragraph or two? Yeah, it's very short. Thank you. So we're not swearing in our witness. Thank you. I, I don't know if your mic is on. And move it a little closer. And we do appreciate you being here. Thank you. Is the light on? No, it's not on. I apologize. You want, you just get the, yeah, that's maybe the issue. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Distinguished members of the committee, my name is Christine Grenier. I'm first secretary in the political section at the French Embassy. Allegations have been voiced 
on the role of France in the Oil for Food program. The French Embassy will prepare a written statement in response to these unjustified allegations. And I would appreciate your allowing this statement to be included in the hearing record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. We appreciate you honoring the committee with your presence. We'll be happy to insert it into the record, and without objection, that will happen. Thank you very much. This time, the chair would uh, uh, note that we have Ambassador Patrick F. Kennedy, the United States Representative to the United Nations for UN Management and Reform, U.S. Mission to the UN, U.S. Department of State. And at this time, the uh, chair would um, swear in our witness, as we do for all our witnesses. Raising your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Note for the record that our witnesses respond in the affirmative and thank him for his patience and for the panel that's followed. Uh, this obviously is a, a hearing of some interest to the members. And uh, Mr. Ambassador, this is, uh, you've appeared before us before and I thank you for your presence. Thank you for your statement and uh, you have the floor. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee, I welcome the opportunity to appear before you again to discuss what is commonly known as the United Nations Oil for Food Program. Mr. Chairman, recent allegations of corruption and mismanagement under the Oil for Food program have been targeted not only at the Saddam regime, but also at companies and individuals doing business under the program and at UN personnel and contractors. We believe that every effort should be made to investigate these allegations seriously and to determine the facts in each case. As you are aware, there are currently several congressional investigations looking into the question of oil for food. The Independent Inquiry Commission, headed by Paul Volcker, and the Iraqi Board of Supreme Audit in Baghdad are also conducting their own investigations. As these inquiries go forward, you have my assurance and that of my staff to cooperate fully with you and your colleagues on other committees and provide all possible additional information and assistance. I welcome the opportunity today to answer your questions relating to these investigations on how the program was created and operated. At the outset, Mr. Chairman, I want to reiterate several points I made here previously in April. First, I need to emphasize that the establishment of the Oil for Food program was the result of difficult and arduous negotiations among 15 Security Council members, a number of whom advocated the complete lifting of sanctions against Iraq. The Oil for Food program was in no way perfect, but it was, at the time, the best achievable compromise to address the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Iraq in the mid-1990s while maintaining effective restrictions on Saddam's ability to rearm. Sanctions have always been an imperfect tool, but given the U.S. national goal of restricting Saddam's ability to obtain new materials of war, sanctions represented an important tool in our efforts. Mr. Chairman, given this general context, I would now allow like to outline some of the details of how the program worked, how it was created, by whom, and how it operated and was monitored. A comprehensive sanction regime was established under UN Security Council Resolution 661 in August 1990 under the Saddam Hussein regime, after the Saddam Hussein regime invaded Kuwait. The Council's unanimity on the issue of Iraq eroded as key Council delegations became increasingly concerned over the negative impact of sanctions on the Iraqi population. The lack of food supplies and the increase in mortality rates were worldwide news. The concept of a humanitarian program to alleviate the suffering of the people of Iraq was initially considered in 1991 under UN Security Council Resolution 706 and 712, but the Saddam regime rejected those proposals. The Council eventually adopted UN Security Council Resolution 986 in 1995, which provided the legal basis for what became known as the Oil for Food Program. While Council members were the drafters and negotiators of this text, the Memorandum of Understanding signed between the UN and the former government of Iraq was negotiated between Iraqi government officials and representatives of the Secretary General, in particular his legal counsel, on behalf of and at the request of the Security Council. Yes, yes. Under the provisions of Resolution 986 in the MOU, the Iraqi government as a sovereign entity 
retain the responsibility for contracting with buyers and sellers of Iraq's choosing and the responsibility to distribute humanitarian items to the Iraqi population. The retention of Iraqi sovereignty was, assist, was insisted upon by Saddam and was supported by other members of the Security Council, as well as other member states. The exception to this was for the three northern governments of Iraq, where UN agencies, at the request of the Council, served as a de facto administrative body that contracted for non-bulk goods and distributed the monthly food ration. The Sanctioned Committee was established under Resolution 661 in 1990, also known as the 661 Committee, monitored member states' implementation of the comprehensive sanctions on Iraq, and also was authorized to monitor the implementation of the Oil for Food program after its inception. The 661 Committee, like all sanctions committees, operated as a subsidiary body of the Security Council and was comprised of representatives from the same 15 member nations as the Council. The committee was chaired by the ambassador of one of the rotating 10 elected members of the Council. The committee, during its lifetime, was chaired by the ambassadors of Finland, Austria, New Zealand, Portugal, the Netherlands, Norway, and Germany. Decision-making in the committee was accomplished on a consensus basis. All decisions taken by the committee required the agreement of all members. This procedure is used in all subsidiary sanctions committees of the Security Council. In providing oversight and monitoring of the sanctions, the committee and each of its members, including the U.S., was responsible for reviewing humanitarian contracts, oil spare parts contracts, and oil pricing submitted on a regular basis by, the, by Iraq to the United Nations for approval. The committee was also responsible for addressing issues related to noncompliance and sanctions busting. In my previous testimony and statement for the record, I provided an explanation of what we knew about issues rating, relating to noncompliance, what we did to address them, and the degree of success we had in addressing these issues within the confines of the 661 Committee. When the United States became aware of issues related to noncompliance or manipulation of the oil food program by the Saddam regime, we raised these concerns in the Committee, often in concert with our United Kingdom counterparts. At our request, the committee held lengthy discussion and debate over, for example, allegations of oil pricing manipulation, kickbacks on contracts, illegal smuggling, and misuse of ferry services. To provide the 661 committee with additional insight on issues related to noncompliance, we also organized outside briefings by the commander of the Multilateral Interception Force and other U.S. agencies. Our success in addressing issues of noncompliance was directly related to the willingness of other members of the, of the uh, committee to take action. Given the consensus rule for decision-making in the committee, the ability of the U.S. and the United Kingdom to take measures to counter or address noncompliance was often inhibited by other members' desire to ease sanctions on Iraq. As reflected in many of the 661 committee records that have been shared with your committee, the atmosphere within the committee, particularly as the program evolved by the late 90s, was often contentious and polemic, given the fundamental political dis disagreement between member states over the Security Council's imposition and continuance of comprehensive sanctions, a debate exacerb exacerbated by the self-serving national economic objectives of certain key member states. Mr. Chairman, you have recently been in Baghdad, and you know that the voluminous oil for food documents are now being safeguarded for use by the Board of Supreme Audit in their investigation. The American Embassy in Baghdad is currently working on a memorandum of understanding between the United States and the government of Iraq regarding access to these documents. We will keep this committee updated on the status of these negotiations. Mr. Chairman, as you and your fellow distinguished committee colleagues continue re your review of the oil for food program, Key issues in your assessment likely will be whether the program achieved its overall objectives and whether the program could have been better designed at its inception to preclude what some have suggested were fundamental flaws in its design. In retrospect, had the program been constructed differently, perhaps by eliminating Iraqi contracting authority and the resulting large degree of autonomy afforded to Saddam to pick suppliers and buyers, then the allegations currently facing the program might not exist. One can postulate the elimination of this authority 
and the, the establishment of another entity to enter into contracts on behalf of the former government of Iraq. And this entity might have had tighter oversight of financial flows, thus inhibiting Saddam Hussein's ability to cheat the system through illegal transactions. The problem is, of course, that these specific decisions to allow the government of Iraq to continue to exercise authority, to let Saddam Hussein continue to determine who, could he, who he could sell oil to and purchase goods from, were all done in the larger context of a political debate on Iraq. It was reluctantly accepted to ensure that the significant sanctions program would remain in place, thus achieving a U.S. goal. Mr. Chairman, here I want to reiterate a point that I made earlier on the issue of sovereignty. While we opposed the authoritarian regime of the former Saddam era, Iraq was and is a sovereign nation. Sovereign nations are generally free to determine to whom they will sell their national products and from whom they purchase supplies. Members of the Security Council, as well as other member states, insisted on upholding this aspect of Iraq's sovereign authority. These were the arrangements that prevailed under the Oil for Food program, given this reality. Could alternate arrangements have been devised, such as authorizing the United Nations or some other entity to function as the contracting party representing the people of Iraq in oil sales and humanitarian goods procurement? The answer, given that there was not the political will in the Security Council to use its authorities to take charge of Iraq's oil sales and humanitarian goods procurement, depended on the Iraqi agree regime's agreement, and it did not. Ambassador, I'm going to have you just summarize when we get back. You can think what your summary will be when the other members get back. But we have a vote now, and I'm going to get to that vote. So we're going Certainly. to recess. Thank you. this hearing to order. Uh, Ambassador Kennedy, there's going to be a vote in a few minutes, so the other members are going to probably be staying there. But I, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to go through your entire statement and uh, uh, move, the, if you would, your mic back to you. Uh, and um, move a little closer, if you would. Uh, so you just continue with your statement, and, and uh, we'll put it on the record, which is what I'd like. I'd like to hear it as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The Security Council's original scheme for the Oil for Food program, outlined in resolutions 706 and 712 in 1991, were for a program that would utilize the revenue derived from the sale of Iraqi oil to finance the purchase of humanitarian supplies for use by the Iraqi people. It was repeatedly rejected by the Saddam government. Even after the Council adopted uh, Resolution 986 on April 14th of 1995, the resolution that established the Oil for Food program, it took more than 13 months of protracted negotiations before Saddam Hussein finally agreed to proceed, a considerable delay given the ongoing and urgent needs of the Iraqi people. Mr. Chairman, any plan that would have denied the authority of the Iraqi government to select its own purchases of Iraqi oil and suppliers of humanitarian products would have been rejected by a number of key Security Council member states. You and your committee colleagues will recall that most, if not all, the resolutions concerning Iraq adopted by the Security Council reaffirmed Iraq's sovereignty and territorial integrity. It would not have been possible politically to win support from various UN member states 
for any arrangement that denied Iraq its fundamental authorities as a sovereign nation. And that would have endangered the durability of the sanctions regime that helped Saddam's access to war materials. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I want to underscore the obligations of all UN member states to implement and enforce the comprehensive multilateral sanctions imposed by the Security Council under Resolution 661. It was not possible for the sanctions to be effective, nor to prevent Saddam Hussein from evading the sanctions through the smuggling of oil and the purchase of prohibitive goods without the full cooperation of other states. I appreciate this, that this committee is carefully reviewing this matter, and I would encourage you to consider the actions of other states in the context of the Oil for Food program. The United Nations, first and foremost, is a collective body composed of its 191 members. A fundamental principle inherent <coughs> in the UN Charter is that member states will accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council in accordance with the Charter. In this regard, the effectiveness of the Oil for Food program, as well as the larger comprehensive sanctions regimes against Iraq, largely depended on the ability and willingness of UN member states to implement and enforce sanctions. In the 661 Committee, the subsidiary body of the Security Council tasked with monitoring sanctions compliance, sanctions violations could be addressed only if there was collective will and consensus to do so. As you review the effectiveness of the Oil for Food program and the sanctions against Iraq in general, I encourage you to keep in mind a that a decision to take effective action to address noncompliance issues requires consensus in the 661 Committee, a consensus that repeatedly proved elusive. And in reviewing the effectiveness of the UN Secretariat, it may be relevant to recall that the staff and contractors that are hired to implement the the staff and contractors are hired to implement the decisions of member states. They operate within the mandates given to them. In this regard, Resolution 986 and the 1996 Memorandum of Understanding between the United Nations and the former government of Iraq defined the mandate governing the work of the independent inspection agents appointed by the Secretary General who authenticated the arrival in Iraq of goods ordered and approved under oil for food contracts. Lloyd's Registry of the United Kingdom initially performed this function on behalf of the UN. When the Lloyd's contract expired, the Swiss firm Katechna was hired by the UN to continue this authentication function. As defined in Resolution 986 and the subsequent MOU, the independent inspection agents, Lloyds and then Cotechnum, were tasked with cons inspecting only those shipments of humanitarian supplies under, under, ordered under the Oil for Food program. Lloyds, Registry, and Cotechnum agents were not authorized by the Security Council to serve as Iraq's border guards or customs officials. They lacked the authority to prevent the entry into Iraq of non-oil for food goods. That function and responsibility belong solely to Iraqi border and customs officers given Iraq's sovereignty and to every UN member state given the sanctions in place. The United Nations and its agents, Lloyd's Registry, Katek, and Sable were not responsible for enforcing sanctions compliance. In May 2001, the U.S. and U.K. delegations circulated a draft resolution to other Security Council members that would have tightened border, border monitoring by neighboring states as part of a smart sanctions approach to Iraq. Certain Council members, as well as representatives of Iraq's neighbors, strongly opposed the U.S.-U.K. text, and the draft resolution was never adopted. Resolution 986 and the 1996 Memorandum of Understanding also called for monitoring by outside agents of Iraq's oil exports. The Dutch firm Sable performed this function under the Oil for Food program. Sable representatives oversaw oil loadings at the Mina El Bakr loading platform and monitored the authorized outbound flow of oil from Iraq to Turkey at Sahan. Sable monitors were not authorized by the Security Council to search out and prevent illegal oil shipments by the former Iraqi regime. This was the responsibility of each member state. The multinational uh, maritime interception force operating in the Persian Gulf also was tasked with preventing Iraq's illegal oil smuggling. Mr. Chairman, now that the Oil for Food program has ended, <coughs> Questions concerning the efficacy of the program have arisen in light of the appearance of documents belonging to the former Iraqi regime. 
These documents were never publicly shared during Saddam Hussein's rule with the Security Council or the 661 Committee. A fair question to pose is what might have happened had the Oil for Food program never been established. While any response is purely conjecture, it is fair to assume that the humanitarian crisis besetting the people of Iraq in the mid-1990s would have only worsened over time given the impact of the comprehensive sanctions on Iraq and Saddam Hussein's failure to provide for the needs of his own civilian population. A deteriorating humanitarian situation among the Iraqi people would have increased calls among more and more nations for a relaxation and or removal of the comprehensive re sanctions restrictions on Iraq, <clears throat> thereby undermining ongoing U.S. and U.K. efforts to limit Saddam's ability to rearm. While the U.S. and U.K. may have succeeded in formally retaining sanctions against Iraq, fewer and fewer nations would have abided by them in practice given the perceived harmful impact such measures were thought to be having on Iraqi civilians. This would have given Saddam even greater access to prohibitive items which would, with which to pose a renewed threat to Iraq's neighbors and to the region. Did the Oil for Food program help to relieve the humanitarian crisis in Iraq and the suffering of the Iraqi people? Despite what might in the end be identified as inherent flaws, the Oil for Food program did enjoy measurable success in meeting the day-to-day -day needs of Iraq civilians. Could the program have been designed along lines more in keeping with the U.S. government competitive bidding and <coughs> procurement rules only if other council members and the former Iraqi government itself had supported such a proposal? In the end, the Oil for Food program reflected three merged concepts a collective international desire to assist and improve the lives of Iraq's civilian population, a desire by the U.S. and others to prevent Saddam from acquiring materials of war and from posing a renewed regional and international threat, and efforts by commercial enterprises and a number of states to pursue their own national economic and financial interests despite the interests of the international community to contain the threat posed by Saddam's regime. Mr. Chairman, thank you for this opportunity to appear again before this committee. I now stand ready to answer whatever questions you or your fellow committee members may wish to pose. Thank you, sir. I thank you, uh, Ambassador. Um, since no other members really are here now, um, what I'll do, and since we do have a vote, I'll, I'll go back to the vote, and uh, then we'll just start with questioning. Thank you. Yes, sir. The committee stands at recess. Call the hearing to order, and uh, thank you, Mr. Kennedy. And, and I also want to apologize to our second panel for all the delays. Um, I, um, I'd like to just start by, by responding to your closing that suggests that, um, that basically, you, you, let me, uh, be clear you accept this point, Mr. Uh, Ambassador Kennedy. Basically, you are saying that because Saddam and Iraq were a sovereign nation, um, you are saying that, um, and because he was not willing to abide by a stricter oil for food program, that we, we, the UN, conceded in allowing him to pretty much write his own ticket. And um, that the alternative was what? And that's what I don't understand. In other words, um, are you suggesting that the sanctions worked? It's not on. It's not on. Your mic's not on.
Light should go on. Okay, not on. Okay, we'll figure that out. Take your time. Take your time. I want to just tap the mic to see if it works. <laughs> no. Now, is that mic on? If you turn that on. Try now. Mr. Right now. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, just so. For transparency, let me disclose there is a button evidently that I can hit <laughs> that can turn off all mics. Mr. Power I did I'm, not know I had. I, I am always pleased to defer to the chairman of this committee. Well, uh, don't tempt me hitting that button. That's wonderful. <laughs> okay. Um, let's just start over again. Take two. Bottom line, are you suggesting that the sanctions worked? Mr. Chairman, we do not believe that, that we permitted Saddam Hussein to write his own ticket. I think that's evident from the fact that it took almost 15 months between the time that Resolution 986 was, was passed by the Security Council and the, uh, the end of the negotiations to formulate the, uh, the MOU. Saddam Hussein was obviously interested in achieving the maximum amount of flexibility that he could. The United States, the United Kingdom, and others were interested in putting the maximum number of constraints on Saddam Hussein. We had a goal. Saddam Hussein had goals. All these goals were in the context of other member states of the Security Council and, and additionally other member states of the United Nations who had very, very different views on sanctions, some of them philosophical, some of them related to Saddam Hussein. The United States, the United Kingdom, and others pushed very, very hard to get the maximum amount of oversight of, of uh, the sanctions regime. Those, that, those activities were resisted by others. What I'm suggesting is that though the program certainly was not perfect, as, as the work that, that you and your committee members have done amply demonstrate, I'm suggesting, though, that in the absence of these sanctions, we would have probably had a very, very less, less fulsome uh, situation. I might note that in 2002, the United States and the United Kingdom were holding, meaning denying permission, to over $5.4 billion in contracts that Saddam Hussein wished to execute. So th it was a balance. The need to alleviate the horrible suffering of the Iraqi people, suffering brought on by Saddam Hussein, at the same time to put into effect the most rigorous sanctions regime that we could politically uh, establish. Uh, I have to t say, you take my breath away. And I feel like you're digging into a hole that I'm <clears throat> sorry you're going into. Because uh, it sounds to me like some critics' concern about the State Department's doublespeak. And it sounds like doublespeak to me. Let me explain to you why. The sanctions didn't work. But we had this program to, what, save face for the United States or whatever. Uh, we had a program that allowed Saddam to sell oil uh, at a price below the market and to get kickbacks. And we had a program that allowed him to buy commodities above the price and get kickbacks. He had the capability to take now this illegal money in addition to the leakage that they had. I mean, we're looking at the oil for food program as a $4.4 billion ripoff to the Iraqi people going to Saddam. And then the $5.7 billion of just illegal oil being sold through Jordan 
and Syria and Turkey. Um, but let's just focus on the $4.4 billion. In addition, though, within that oil for food program, he had what was considered legitimate money that he could then pay for commodities and bought things that were simply not what he was supposed to be purchasing. So you, you need to tell me how those sanctions worked, if he could do that. And, and I, don't know how you can, I don't know how you can tell me that they worked when that happened. Are you disputing that $4.4 billion was basically ripped off uh, and ended up in his hands? No, sir, I'm not. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll accept it, that. Are you, are you in agreement that this isn't the oil for food program, but it was the sanctions? Are you in disagreement that he didn't filter about $5.7 billion of oil sales illegally through uh, the neighboring states? Saddam Hussein engaged in oil smuggling, okay. which, if I might, Mr. Chairman, was not part of the oil for food program. No, no it wasn't. He, it, it Saddam wasn't. Hussein. I think we could we all agree that Saddam Hussein was an evil man who attempted to manipulate no, no, any I, opportunity. No, I, I don't want to go down whether he's evil or not right now. I just want to go da back over how you <clears throat> can defend these sanctions. And I don't even know why you went down that door. You got to tell me why you why are you even going in that direction? Because I, I think, Mr. Chairman, that the sanctions enabled. Saddam Hussein to be deprived of weapons of war and dual use items. Is it your testimony uh, and your comfort level that the $10.1 billion was not used to purchase uh, weapons? I, no, sir. I am saying that the sanctions regime assisted, I, I said in my testimony, that it is not a perfect system. But the, he attempted to purchase materials under the sanctions through the UN oil for food process. We put holes on those. We stopped his purchasing of materials overtly, dual use items. He attempted to purchase, for example, dump, dump trucks and heavy equipment transporters. Dump trucks are easily convertible into rocket launchers because of the hydraulic mechanisms on the back and a heavy equipment transporter that can move a bulldozer or a crane is the same piece of equipment essentially that you use to move tanks. Is it your testimony that you know what he bought? Are you comfortable with the documents that came from Sabolt and uh, Connect Cotecna? Uh, are, you, are you testifying that, uh, <clears throat> that when they testify and basically come before us and say that he uh, was not abiding by the sanctions, uh, bought material he shouldn't have. Are you saying he bought material that he should have and that the system worked? You, you can't be saying that. I'm, uh, no, sir. What I'm saying is that the contracts that ran through the Oil for Food program ran through the 661 committee when the United States, using the example of our own nation, received those contracts, proposals. Those contracts were vetted by any number of Washington agencies that were specialists in that regard. They vetted those contracts to make sure that none of the material included therein were weapons of war or dual or, or potential dual use items. Is your testimony before this committee that, that in fact you believe that? Those documents? I believe I believe that the United States reviewed contracts and held on contracts that were that would have been given Saddam Hussein weapons of war or dual use materials. Yes, we stopped, you know, as I mentioned in, in two thousand and two we were holding on five point five Ambassador, 5 Ambassador I'm not I'm not asking that. What I'm asking is so you stop some you stop some uh, transactions uh, but are you uh, testifying as a representative of the United States that uh, this system uh, that uh, this committee certainly believes is a paper tiger was not a paper tiger? Are you, do you basically believe that Cotecna and Sabolt had the power, Sabolt had the power to uh, properly monitor? Is that your, I, I want to say yeah. it again, is it the, uh, representing the United States of America, you coming before this committee under oath, 
and telling us that this system worked and that both companies were able to verify and properly manage this program? That's the question I'm asking you. And I want you to think long and hard before you answer it. I think, Mr. Chairman, that you're conducting an investigation, an investigation we welcome. If Saddam Hussein was moving materials into Iraq outside of those which were contracted for under the Oil for Food program, he and someone else were engaged in smuggling and san sanction well, that, busting. That's a no-brainer statement, but it's yes. not answering my question. No, I, I, yes, sir. Okay, I really want you to just answer my question. I want you to think a second and answer the question. You, you, Is it your testimony representing the State Department, representing the administration, that this program, uh, that the way this program was set up, ensured that Saddam Hussein uh, uh, that these two companies were able to properly enforce the uh, sanctions. That's the question. Right. Were they given the power necessary? Were you given the cooperation necessary with the other members of the Security Council, the 661 Committee? Absolutely not. Okay. Let's just, work, not. Let's just work on that. That's, that. You're digging yourself out of a hole right now. Okay, let's, let's work on that one. The bottom line is they weren't, correct? Tell me, in your words, what the problem was with the program. The problem was that in attempting to, in, in the negotiating process that takes place in the international arena all the time, the ultimate resolution passed by the Security Council, which was a process of negotiation, did not authorize either Katechna or Sabolt or X or Y or Z of anyone to become all-encompassing sanction enforcement agents. Well, I mean, I, I, and I, that's the extreme that they didn't do. Tell me the limit, the, the minimum that they did. I mean, what power did these companies have? They're, they're, they were empowered under the resolution to validate goods that were being shipped into Iraq that were declared to be part of the Oil for Food program. Okay, now, you're familiar with this program. Yes, sir. Were they able to do that? That is, that is the subject of no, the... No, 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 that's not what I'm asking. This is an investigation to know, and I want to know if my own government that's supposed to be overseeing this, that I frankly thought had problems with this program, I want to know if they were properly able to, to oversee this program. It is a simple and very clear answer. And I want to make sure, under oath, you are stating it clearly. Not, not something you want me to believe, but I want to know the truth. And the committee wants to know the truth. And I want to have some confidence that my government that was overseeing it knew what the heck was going on. Were they able to properly oversee this program? It's a simple Be answer. Because of, because of the efforts of Saddam Hussein, the, the, and that in that sense, no, sir, they no, were not. not in any sense. Uh, in any sense, they were not able to. Now, the reasons why, we'll explore later. Right. But were they able to properly oversee this program? I mean, you do know they're testifying afterwards, Absolutely, don't you? yes, sir. And, and you, 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 you are aware of the, the complaints that they had, I hope. Yes, sir. Even before this hearing, correct? Yes, absolutely, Okay, sir. were they properly able to fulfill their responsibilities and oversee this program? I think the answer to that is up to a point yes and beyond that point okay, no. Okay, well no. then, you're gonna have to tell me up to a point yes and, and beyond no. And, and because uh, I think the answer is a clear no, and I don't think up to much of a point. So you tell me up to what point were they able to? The the, they, they were empowered by the resolution of the Security Council to, to authenticate materials that were arriving. They, they authenticated those materials. Wait a second. Are you saying that they authentic, uh, authenticated these materials? Are you saying they had a theoretical power to do it? Or are you saying that they actually were able to do it? And there's a difference. It was their mission to authenticate I, the material. I, I don't want to know what their mission is. I want to know if they were able to. To the, 
I was not at every border station, sir. They, they authenticated the materials and they submitted documents to the United Nations saying it, that they had authenticated those materials. Isn't it a fact that they complained that they couldn't authenticate? Isn't that a fact that they said they did, didn't always have the people? Isn't it a fact that they said sometimes they didn't, couldn't even look in terms of Sabo, that they couldn't even Absolutely. be there uh, sometimes? And when they left, isn't it a fact that they had suspicions that? Absolutely. I mean, Okay. And we've testified to that, sir. Well, yes, sir. I know. That's what's frustrating okay. me, and I don't need to get frustrated. And you're a friend. You're no. someone who was in Iraq, and I have awesome respect Thank for. Thank you. What concerns me is that somehow you're, you're giving a party line that even you don't believe. I mean, that's the way I'm feeling, and I'm very I'm I feel very awkward no. to have this dialogue with you in, in, a, in a public setting. But it is, it is so logical, and it's, it's almost frightening to me that we can't at least have the truth uh, and then work from that as to uh -huh. why. I don't want to know why they weren't able to authent to be to authenticize, authenticize the, the fact that this happened. I, I, I don't want to know why they couldn't right now. I want to know if they did. Then we'll explore why they couldn't. Mr. Chairman, I've, I've tried to answer the question the best I can. I believe, and I appreciate the compliment that you just paid me. I believe that Katechna and Sabolt attempted to carry out the functions that they had. You I and I agree. They attempted to do it. So we agree on that. So, yes, we, we, so we're on one level. We're, we're in agreement. Yes, sir. The issue is could they? And the answer is a simple. The, the, the results, absolutely, the results were not perfect. Yes, no, sir. I didn't say perfect. The perfect gives too much discretion. Yes, sir. Perfect may mean it was 99%. Um, and, and I don't even think it was close to 50%. I don't think they had the power, and I don't think anyone who's looked at this program believes this, they had the power. And I think they're going to testify they didn't have the power. And what concerns me is you are basically trying to give the impression that they weren't perfect, but, and I think that's very misleading to the committee. And I think it, it, it's just really, uh, no. it, it doesn't do you credit. I don't want you to say anything you don't believe. I just don't want you to speak in words that don't frankly help us. I want you to be more precise. Were they able to make sure that oil sales were actually the oil sales they were and that commodities that were purchased were actually what was bought to the amounts that were bought, the quality and so on? Were they? Maybe you could look at that note and hopefully someone else is telling you to say no. I think that the, okay, try. It was the position of the United States and joined by the United Kingdom that we wanted a more robust inspection regime. We wanted, we wanted that we wanted more robust inspections. And obviously, I think I think I'm trying to answer your point where where I'm saying that that yes, there were there were there were. The restraints. Department. There were restraints inherent in the program that prevented. Kotechna and Sabolt and Lloyd's before that to doing. The, the problem with your word robust is like your word perfect. Uh, it wasn't robust, so to say that you wanted it to be more is almost meaningless, in my judgment at least, yes, as I've looked at this. Um, this was a program that was basically not working. And I wanted you to start us off to explain why it wasn't working. You have given me a justification as to why we basically allowed for this program to go forward even though it wasn't working. So you have given a lot of people cover, but you haven't helped us yeah. understand whether you, the government, the State Department, this administration felt this program worked. You are trying to give us the impression that it was working but not perfect, that it was robust but it could be more robust. That to me is misleading. And that's what, what I'm wrestling with. And I want to understand why. Why do you want me to have this impression? Mr. Chairman, I, I grant you this was, I'm, I'm looking for another word other than perfect. I, I, have you been instructed to say that this program worked when it didn't work? No, sir, I'm okay. not. Okay, so are you free to say, uh, was there any meeting that you had before that said, under no circumstances, are you supposed to agree that the program didn't work? No, sir. Okay. Was the program working? The program accomplished some of its goals, as I've said. Well, what, what were the goals? The goals 
The goals of the Oil for Food program were to relieve the humanitarian crisis of the Iraqi people and, so that's and, hard work. and retain and retain a sanctions regime on Saddam Hussein that would assist in restricting his desire to rearm. He had other means of attempting to rearm. As you rightly pointed out, sir, he, had, he, he attempted and he did utilize those means. But the program did deliver food and medicine and other supplies and equipment to the Iraqi people. That part we concede. We're, well, I'm going to concede that part. Uh, because we knew that Iraqis were starving, and we knew they weren't getting medicine, and we knew that Saddam Hussein was willing to starve and kill his people and deprive them of medicine, we decided to cave in and accept a program that simply on the face looked like we hadn't caved in, looked like there were sanctions, but in fact it was about as leaky as it could get. And I wanted to understand if you understood that it was very leaky. Instead, you used the words, I wanted it to be more robust and I wanted okay. it to be perfect, but it wasn't perfect and it wasn't more robust. The bottom line was almost every transaction, it appears, may have been a ripoff, may have been uh, a, a transaction that compromised the UN, compromised other people, and allowed Saddam Hussein to make money illegally uh, without uh, the world community having uh, to agree that he was. That's the way I look no. at it. Tell me what's wrong with my picture. Your picture is absolutely correct. Okay. Saddam Hussein, uh, your you, you mentioned earlier, sir, and we're in our discussion that, that you take Saddam Hussein. He was sanction busting from 1991 until the Oil for Food program started in 1995, 1996. He was sanction busting. The Oil for Food program was put into place. He, he attempted to get around the sanctions regime at every possible opportunity. And the irony he is... He priced... I, yes, sir. I, yeah, go on, go on. He attempted to write contracts for oil where he, was, he priced the oil below the market rate and attempted to, to, uh, to uh, pocket that premium. We discovered that, and the U.S. and the U.K. raised that in the 661 committee and then halted all price setting under the old scheme until we achieved putting a new system into place which set the oil price retroactively after the sale, in other words, stopping him from getting a surcharge. Having blocked him on that regard, he then moved to another aspect, which was kickbacks after the sales. We attempted to block that. And at the, so as you, it, was a, it was almost, and I hate to say this, a chess game. He attempted to maneuver, and we attempted with certain allies, but not enough of them, to, to cease and block his activities. And See, so the, the I'm agreeing that uh, sanctions are leaky. The sanctions regime did not work as it was intended, i.e., to have 100% No, don't say 100%. Don't say 100%, because I'm not even sure you had 50%. I, I, so don't say 100%. Yes. No, I mean, see, what's, if the truth comes out, whatever the truth is, it may embarrass the United States, it may embarrass someone else, it may embarrass Congress, but it will be the truth. And from the truth, we can learn from it. And my problem right now is, what you're suggesting is that basically Saddam was willing to kill his people uh, by not getting them food and not getting medicine, uh, and he wasn't willing to do an oil for food program uh, that we wanted, so ultimately did we, we did a program that he wanted. Uh, he was able to buy or sell in euros. He was able to undersell his oil. He was able to overpay for commodities. He was able to get kickbacks. He was basically able to te tell Kotechna and uh, Sebolt, basically, they had no authority. He was basically able to ignore them. He was basically able to, to, uh, to have more transactions than they could even handle so that they weren't even aware of some transactions. And he did this with the assistance of our allies. 
And it's not a bad thing that, that, that Americans and the world community have to contend with this because it suggests that even before uh, a decision to go into Iraq, it suggests, frankly, to me, that we didn't have the support of our allies, that President Clinton didn't have the support of our allies, uh, and that uh, it was somewhat of a joke. And that when you had a president finally trying to say, you know, we got to make this program work, and we also have to, to look at a regime change if he doesn't cooperate, and we still don't have the assistance of our allies, it says to me, well, what's new? What's new about it? Are, are you saying to us that the Allies cooperated? No, your testimony was the reverse. Yes. Isn't it true that you said the Allies did not cooperate and, and enable us to have a sanction system that is working? Is that a fair statement? We, I totally agree, sir. As I testified, we sought a sanction regime and we were unable to get the sanction regime we wanted. Okay. Yes, sir. Because, because of the lack of willingness on the part of other members of the Security Council and other nations to agree to that sanction regime. Okay. And so they didn't agree with it. And then we had a sanction that Saddam basically could live with. And isn't it true that on occasion the United States uh, protested some of the transactions? We, we contested many of the transactions. Yeah. We were holding at one point, as I, as I mentioned, sir, $5.4 billion worth of proposed transactions. Well, but isn't it true there were actually transactions that happened that you objected to? Uh, no, sir. It was the, uh, the, uh, the system operated on a consensus basis, and if any member of the, uh, the 661 committee representing the uh, member states of the Security Council, if, em if any member objected to a, a transaction, that transaction was held. Okay. Why didn't you object to the fact that Sabot and Kotechna did not have enough manpower and not, were not given the authority they needed to make sure that they were actually documenting the actual transactions? Why didn't, why didn't the United States uh, protest to their inability to accurately document transactions. For example, sir, when we learned that, um, that uh, using the, the Essex case, the, uh, the uh, oil tanker in which it, the, it was topped off after, after, it, had, after it had been loaded, uh, we, did, we did raise that in the 661 committee. We insisted that, that additional personnel, additional technical, matters, whatever. We demanded the 661. And it did happen. And why didn't it happen? So, some of it happened and some of it didn't because it was resisted by other members of the most 661 of committee. Most, most of, of it didn't. Absolutely. Okay. Well, yeah, don't some. I mean most. Most of it did not yeah. happen. And it, it didn't happen because it just took one member to object, correct? Correct. Okay. So you could theoretically prevent a transaction from happening that you knew about, but you couldn't make sure that Kotechna and Sabolt had the authority, the personnel, to make sure that they were properly running this program. The, uh, this, the, the mandate to the, uh, the uh, companies came from, from Security Council resolution and from the 661 committee. Is that a yes or no? Yeah. The answer is that, that their mandate was governed by, by the consensus requirements, and yes, a member state could hold on that consensus, and, and that would have the effect that you outlined. And the effect was? I want, to, I want, you, to, I want you to get in with this here. The, the effect was, why, why can't you say it? Why can't, why can't you say that the bottom line to it was that because member states would object if you wanted Sabolt or Kotechna to have more authority, more personnel, and so on, because they objected to it, uh, they didn't get it. And because they didn't get it, they couldn't do their job properly. Why is that so hard to say? Phrase that way, sir. I have no, I well, why don't you say it? The mandate to Kotechna, to Sabolt, was governed was governed from the, the original Security Council resolution and then implemented in the Memorandum of Understanding and in the, in the 661 Committee. Efforts to achieve our goals on sanctions were blocked by other member states. That's not the same thing that I said, which you agreed with. 
what I wanted you to know, what I wanted to know from you is whether you could say this. And if you can't because you don't believe it, then tell me you don't believe it. Don't agree with my statement and then, yes, and then uh, tell me something else in your answer. What I said was because a member state could block the United States or Great Britain from wanting uh, Sabo or Connected to have enough authority and enough personnel to properly document transactions because member states could veto that any one state okay. and did that they did not have enough personnel and they did not and were not able to properly document transactions. You, would, you said to me you agree with that statement, but you can't say it in your own words. And, and I just don't understand why it's hard for you to say it in your own words that way. I guess, sir, because I think what I, the only distinction I'm trying to draw, if I might, is that there were transactions outside the scope of the oil for food program. But we've, we put those aside. We're just focused on the oil for food. All right. Then, yes, that there were, that Kotechna and Sabold and their predecessors in one case did not always have the resources they needed to do their job, yes. Or the authority? Yes. Because, yes what? Yes, they did not, the, because, yes, they did not have the full authority to do their job because their, their, the mandate from the Security Council was not as broad as we wish it would have been. I wish it would have been as it should have been, correct? Should have been, yes. Yeah. Our, it, our, it was our goal, as I said, to have a more, to have a more robust sanctions regime. That, that, that's no, no, don't say more robust. It was not robust at all. It was, a, it was a paper tiger. It was a leaky sieve. It enabled Saddam to get $4.4 .4 billion. It was a joke. And you don't have to say it was a joke. I can say it was a joke, but you, can, you and I can certainly agree it wasn't robust. Was it a robust program? No, sir. It was not a robust program. Okay. Was it close to being a robust program? I think I'm... Was it close to being a robust program? No, it was not close to being a robust okay, program. Okay. Well, let's leave it right there. Uh, Mr. Waxman. Mr. Chairman, uh, earlier today at this hearing, we, uh, I moved for two subpoenas, and uh, uh, we held off any vote on them. As I understand it, you're willing to issue the uh, first subpoena to the uh, Federal Reserve Bank in New York to get the information that we've requested. And rather than issue a second subpoena, you've suggested that you and I write a letter to the Department of Defense requesting the information that we wanted uh, and would have subpoenaed. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I want to thank you for your uh, suggestion of resolving these uh, subpoena questions in that way. I think it will be very helpful for us to issue the letter to Secretary Rumsfeld insisting he comply with this request. And of course, I take you at your word that the committee will follow up aggressively if the Pentagon fails to provide the documents we've requested. I think this is a reasonable way to proceed. And rather than have a, a vote on it, I would like to uh, uh, have this uh, understanding memorialized at this point in the hearing so that we can go ahead with the one subpoena and issue a joint letter from the, from the two of us in, in lieu of the second subpoena. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the gentleman's uh, one effort and interest in this issue. I think he's correct in wanting to get these documents. Um, I, I do uh, totally agree that uh, uh, the bank needs a subpoena. And uh, I also want to say to you that, um, that we've asked uh, for 12 documents or records, I mean, more than 12, but we've made 12 specific requests that are quite extensive. And uh, it is my expectation that uh, the Secretary will provide these documents. And if he doesn't, then we need to follow up with the subpoena. Well, I thank you very much. I, I certainly agree with you. And I think this is a reasonable way for us to proceed to, to have all the information which our committee ought to have as we uh, do the investigation in, in, in all respects. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here.
Thank you. Mr. Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a couple questions here that I, and I apologize, some of these were covered while I was out on the floor of uh, the House. But, uh, Ambassador, I, I thank you for being here. And I wanted to know where do we stand with the status of gaining access to the United Nations Oil for Food Program documents for Congress uh, now? And uh, um, can, you, can you give me some background on where we stand right now? Um, the uh, State Department has asked uh, Chairman Volcker of the Independent Investigating Committee for the release of the documents. And at, up to this point, uh, he, has, he has declined, saying that he, he is using these documents and he intends to, to conduct his investigation. And he has declined no. to release them, sir. Those would just be documents, the official UN documents? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Or is anyone trying to pursue documents from other countries? Too? Is there uh, any attempt to do that? Yes, sir. There is. Um, bef before I left Baghdad in August, I had presented to the uh, the acting chair of the Board of Supreme Audit a proposed memorandum of, of uh, uh, understanding between the United States and 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 Iraq to release for for uh, use uh, government of Iraqi documents. Mm -hmm. And I understand that the, that that work is continuing, and we hope to have. A, a resolution to that request in, in, in the very near future. I checked with Baghdad just the other day, and I'm expecting those, an So those documents being scanned now? We are, we, are, we, are making, we are attempting to make an arrangement between uh, various parties to scan those documents. So, and now, how about the reverse? So we're, we have access to the Iraqi documents. Those will be released soon. W w the request has been made, sir. The yes, sir. The request has been made. How about the reverse? Is there any attempts to obtain documents from some of these other countries that are part of the scandal, Russia, France, China, Syria? I believe that, that, that the request to other nations for their documents is, is within the jurisdiction of uh, the Independent Investigating Commission, Mr. Volker's commission. Are those nations cooperating? Uh, that is a question that would have to be posed to the Independent Investigating Commission, sir. Let me ask about another area here. When, um, when it became apparent that it was some years ago that there, that the issue of uh, the question of some corruption in this oil for food scandal began to take some legs on it, uh, what was the, what was the responsibility of the UN Office of Iraqi Programs to maintain the integrity of this program, and did they act within the scope of their responsibility at that time? That is a question, sir, that is, is actually part of the investigation that is going on now by the Independent Investigating Commission. We are aware of, of information that did come to the attention of the United States, including some from the Office of Iraqi Programs, which then, as a member state, as a member of the 661 Committee, the United States and the United Kingdom did follow up on. Were there other if there is other information that they came, that came into their possession that they should have followed up on that we're unaware of, of course, we're unaware of that information. And that is one of the charges that was given to uh, Chairman Volcker and his colleagues on the Independent Investigating Commission to find out if there was any malfeasance, misfeasance. And I'm not a lawyer, so I may not be using the appropriate words on the part of you and employees. But that is one of the, the mandates of the, uh, of the IIC. To, to look and see if, if UN employees conducted themselves as, as appropriate. But it appears that there's some lack of cooperation in releasing documents that would help us know this. Ch Chairman Volker has indicated to me that, that his investigation is ongoing and he intends to get to the bottom of it and then file a full and complete report. I can only report, sir, what, what, uh, what uh, he has said to me. Does he feel he's getting cooperation from the member nations and from the UN itself fully? He's, he has indicated he's getting full cooperation from, from, uh, the, uh, from the United Nations Secretariat. I, I have not posed the question about, uh, about uh, discussions with other nations. Also in the historical timeline of this, what was the date of which the year of which the concerns about uh, corruption this first began to surface? I believe that, well, we, first of all, I mean, if corruption only within the oil for food program itself or issues about uh, Saddam Hussein's sanctions busting in general. I mean, that first came to the fact that he was engaged in oil smuggling 
uh, it came to our knowledge, you know, in 1991, 1992. That's outside of the Oil for Food program, and efforts were made then by, uh, by the United States and others, and it led to the establishment of the, uh, of the Multinational Interdiction, Maritime Interdiction Force, which uh, were U.S. and other nations' uh, uh, naval assets de deployed in the uh, the Shat el Arab and the in the uh, Gulf to but how about cease the that. But in the oil, we think we first I think became aware of his um, of his schemes related to to oil, the premium on oil pricing in um, in July of 2000. Okay, and did they continue he after that? Pardon me. Did the did the involvement of other countries in the oil for food corruption continue after July of 2000? So even after, after the United States became aware that it continued, we began pushing. We began pushing for a system to bring this under control. It was resisted by other nations. We were challenged. We said, "Do you have hard evidence? Do you have?" Wait, who was, who was asking for the hard evidence? The other other no. nations. Which and, nations was were there? Um, I believe the, the. I think countries such such as uh, as I would have to go back and read the exact. The exact text again. There, uh, there France, 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 Germany? Russia, and Chi France, Russia, and China would China, be the examples. Syria? That S Syria was on the committee at one point. I mean, the, over the course of uh, the 13 years, there were many nations on the. And in 2000, where this first came to our attention, um, so the very nations that are the, the, the nations changed every okay. every year. But what, what, let me make sure so you understand the, what you're the, saying. That the nations that the allegations are against now, at that time, were saying, you don't have any evidence it, on us. Yes, yes, sir. They were saying, do you have hard proof? And we, we said, we are getting these stories. Where it's being reported in, in trade publications. It's being reported elsewhere. This must be addressed. We pushed and we pushed and, and, and met a lot of resistance. And since we were meeting this resistance, if, if I might for a moment, sir, the program then was to set the oil price at the beginning of the month. And then what Saddam was playing off of was the volatility of the oil market where the price would move 10, 15, 20, 50 cents a barrel over the course of the month. And then he would sell at one price and sell to a favored supplier and say, I'm going to sell to you at the peg price of $20.50. But now that the price for the rest of the month is $20.75, you keep a nickel and you kick me back 20 cents. When we saw that that this is what he was doing. And then we met the resistance from others to our activities. What the uh, United States and the United Kingdom then did was to refuse to set an oil price at the beginning of the month. So there was no oil price. Oil sales went on, but there was no price. We then set and agreed to an oil price at the end of the month that would then, that would then deprive Saddam Hussein of playing with that, with the volatility of the market, and by setting a retroactive price, we believe that from the uh, the oil overseers, which were the professionals who had been engaged, that still he was in, he was in potentially making something, but it so might have been order on the order of three three to five cents a barrel, as opposed to on the order of twenty five to fifty cents a barrel, simply because of the movements over the course of the month. And what countries? were involved with that after the United States has worked to, to deal with oil prices at the end of the month. What countries were still purchasing oil and giving him a kickback at that time? We do not know which country. That is a part of the investigation now. We do, I do not have in front of me a confirmed list of which countries were engaged in that. At that time? And, and they, these were, I should say, these were national, these were companies that were purchasing the oil and giving the kickbacks, not nations themselves. Well, that's, that's an important distinction. Was there any role uh, or awareness, for example, the French, the Russian, Chinese governments of uh, these kickbacks going on? We, we informed their members of the 661 committee. So they we were informed. informed. Their, their missions. To Back in what year? Uh, Mid-90s? In, in, in 2000, sir. Okay. When it came to our attention, it was first raised, I believe, on the July 13, 2000 meeting of the 661 committee on oil pricing. And so that's the, that's the definite date by which we know that those member nations were notified. Uh, and I'm assuming in the UN investigation we may find that those member nations knew something prior to that, but we don't know. Uh, that that would be speculation, that. sir, that I 
cannot comment and, on. Uh, but they were notified at least in the year 2000, and yet uh, the oil for food corruption uh, purchasing continued on after that. It didn't end in 2000. It continued on. Am I correct? We, we believe that because of the steps we took for the, to put in retroactive pricing, that we drove the premium or surcharge down from you know, multiple cents a barrel to two or three cents a barrel. But I cannot say that we ended it entirely because Saddam Hussein was always looking for some way to get around the sanctions. Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure. Do I have two more minutes or one more? Uh, let me uh, shift a different line of question here. The total amount of money that I understand Saddam Hussein received from this oil for food corruption was in the nature of $10 billion. Am I correct? $10.1 billion. Um, in the whole package of things here. Well, the, the basically, sir, you have, he, he achieved much more than that if you count in the oil smuggling that took place outside the scope of the oil for food program. And, it, and it's very difficult to get an exact estimate, but, I, but I'm in no position to challenge the figure that, that we're talking about that was provided by the Government Accountability Office. I have every reason to believe that that, that figure is probably in the ballpark. So it's probably in the ballpark. It may be more. Could be a okay. little more, a little less. I mean, okay. he, yes, sir. And what did he do with the money? Um, he d he did a, he did a wide variety of things. I'm sure he some of the sumptuous palaces that 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 are, are extant in in Baghdad at this time are undoubtedly built with that money. And he may and and he may well have done other things. But I don't have I don't have direct and confirmed information about that Will score. we have information from these investigations with regard to what he spent that money on? For example, did he purchase weapons on a black market or directly with that money? I think that I do not believe that that is going to be the subject of the, uh, of, of the, uh, the Volcker, the IIC investigation. That, is, that may come out through, through other U.S. government channels, sir. Well, as we connect the dots, the thing that worries me intensely on this, is not only the oppression Saddam Hussein kept his people under, the tortures and the murders, the killing fields, which continued on at that time, but also it kept his regime going, much of it in sumptuous palaces, which I have seen in Iraq. But the third, it kept his military going. And I would hope that some we would find in this, and I'm sure, Mr. Chairman, this is some of your concerns as well, that if one penny of that was used to buy any bullets or bombs or grenade launchers or anything else, I suspect in a black market because he was not permitted to purchase them overtly. And this is where we have to also connect the dots to find if those companies within those member nations of the UN have blood on their hands against our soldiers. And I would hope that that is part of what this investigation brings out, that those nations who acted holier than thou in saying, you don't have any evidence, you, you don't know anything about what's going on, but also saying, stay away from Iraq, they're nice people, leave them alone, could very well be, and this is the crux of what we have to find out from this investigation, if they were sending the money to Saddam Hussein, which he used to arm his soldiers against the world. I, I agree that that, that <laughs> That was certain. That is something that is absolutely abhorrent. Absolutely, sir. And I hope the world is paying attention to that because all this time, the people are looking at. Let's ask the UN. They're not an altruistic system. Let's ask other member nations to come out somehow decide what is best for the United States. The fact is, no ambassador from another country is given a mission of deciding what's best for the United States. They're all supposed to represent their own nation. And I hope that people pay attention to this, that when you have this sort of absolute power to spend and to find that kind of money, that nations and the businesses that operate within them are not pure. And we may like to think about perhaps these other nations may have some pure motives, but quite frankly, there's too much in the negative column to suggest otherwise. And I, I would hope that the investigation of this committee, led by the chairman and by the UN, would give us that answer. I wish we could get that answer soon. But as it is, um, I go back to my opening statements, too, that it concerns me deeply that these nations, which have been very quick to ask us for help when they needed it, when we asked them for help, if they knowingly participated 
if it was active or passive participations in sending money to this murderer Saddam Hussein, which he then used to keep his military regime in power, which was then used against our own soldiers and citizens, is disgusting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to ask uh, Council to ask if, allow Council to ask a few questions, then I'll have a few more, Ambassador, and then we'll be all set. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ambassador Kennedy, two areas. First, the, much of the, the document, many of the documents the State Department has provided are marked sensitive or classified because of their foreign origin, I believe. Um, in particular, there's been recent media reference to a, a document produced by the Iraqi oil ministry soon after the, the, the governing council and the CPA was in place, characterizing in some detail the oil for food program and abuses. Um, that report is, is marked sensitive and, and classified and not for distribution. I'm wondering what the process is uh, for the United States government to request or accomplish the declassification and public release of such a report. Uh, let me find out. That those exact parameters and, and get back to, and get back to the committee for the record. Thank you. The other area I want to explore um, is this concept of sovereignty, and try to to plumb the depths and the parameters of that concept. Need to speak to okay. It uh, it struck me in your testimony that it, it it is not an absolute that I if you could describe other situations in which sovereignty has been described or observed differently in other UN regimes that it, it's, it struck us from the documents that Saddam simply waited out those who had a, the most expansive view of sovereignty possible, uh, but that other formulations of this program were possible within a plausible concept of sovereignty for a nation that was already under an oppressive sanctions regime, that had already been documented as trying to avoid that sanctions regime. Um, so in, in one sense, that sovereignty had already been severely mortgaged. Um, could you describe those, those details, the negotiations a little more, please? Um, I am. I will first plead that I am not an international lawyer, and I am not. I am not qualified to answer a uh, provide you with a textbook definition of sovereignty. What I what I believe we are talking about here is I will call it a political definition of sovereignty. The United States, the United Kingdom, other allies sought to put into place and did in 1990 after the invasion of Kuwait a complete embargo on the movement of goods and services into Iraq and then it was later amended to permit certain donations of food and medicines but as we as we saw over the course of the years between 1991 and 1995 you know the mortality rate the uh, the, the, the ability of the Iraqis to get basic, basic nutrition was, was, was just simply collapsing because of Saddam Hussein's own unwillingness to treat, to treat his people in a humane sense. This built political pressure on those nations who were in favor of sanctions. And we did not wish to see that sanctions regime end because of our goal of doing whatever possible to restrict the movement of materials of war to Saddam Hussein so they could rearm. So taking the political aspect of, of trying to keep the sanctions in place but seeing the resistance, a series of negotiations took place within and among member states of the United Nations to formulate a new a new regime that first that eventually led to the to the Security Council resolution that the staff the, the Iraq program did we want a program that had more teeth in it than that absolutely but could we get other nations to agree to that fully and completely could we get Saddam Hussein to tell the other nations that he was willing to accept so, that? So the answer we, is no. So we can conclude there is another formulation of the oil for food arrangement that would give Saddam less control but still observe the at, concept of sovereignty at, in, in a as possible I, way. As I said in my testimony, yes, when one, could have, one could have had such another activity. However, in the negotiations that took place, 
in the 661 committee and in the Security Council, we did not achieve that consensus on a regime with more teeth. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Let me ask you, how many, uh, how many uh, months were you in Iraq? I was in Iraq for six months uh, in 2003, and then I went back again for another three-month assignment in 2004, sir. Was that a classified assignment, or can you tell us, bottom line, what you were involved in? Uh, no, sir, I can tell you. I, for the first six months in 2003, I was the Chief of Staff of the Coalition Provisional Authority. And then when I went back in 2004, I was the Chief of Staff of a, of a small unit that was working on the transition from CPA to American Embassy and the transition logistically from the Iraqi Governing Council to the Iraqi Interim Government. Yeah, well, we, we um, know those were not easy assignments, and we, and we sincerely appreciate what you did during that time. I, um, I'd like you to describe to me the uh, Coverly incident, C-L-O-V-E-L-Y, the ship. Are you familiar with it? No, sir. I'm, I'm, a, I'm aware of the, the Essex incident that, that took place several years okay. ago, but I, Mr. Chairman, I will be glad to research no, that and no, provide no, you no, information right. for the record. I'm, I apologize. I am no, unaware you don't, you of don't, such. You don't need to. Uh, if you don't know of the incident, I just assume you not respond to it. Um, I'd like to know um, from you uh, if, w when I listen to your statement, and I really, you know, you, we don't usually allow someone to speak for more than 10 minutes. I wanted to hear your whole statement. I think why I get uneasy is, um, Certain things seem so simple to me, and then they're the hard things, and then I think you, you have a big dialogue about the hard things. The, the easy things are um, that it's clear Saddam starved his people and deprived him of medicine uh, and would have continued to do that unless we had some way to allow him to get food and, and medicine for his people, and we basically decided to let him uh, determine really how the program should function. He decided it was euros, not doctor dollars. He decided who could buy oil. He decided who he would buy commodities from. He basically set the price of oil. He set the price of commodities. He undersold the, uh, his oil. No reason to do that. He overpaid for commodities. No reason to do it unless he did what he did, and that was he got kickbacks in both ways. And um, it, it seems very evident to me that, that uh, both Sebolt and Kotechna did not have the capability, either in personnel or authority, to prevent um, uh, bad things from happening in this program. And so they happened routinely, not on occasion. And so all of that, it seemed to me, we could have just had a quick dialogue. Uh, what, what is of concern to me, and is there anything I just said that you would disagree with? Um, no, sir, Dave, if I do, would that one is that, that neither Sabolt nor Kotechna set the price of oil or set the price of commodities. Right. right? No, they didn't. They, they, and and no, we, and it, no, sir. That, so and everything that I he, said was pretty accurate from your standpoint. Except, standpoint. sir, that he proposed the price of oil. He being? Saddam Hussein proposed the price of oil, but the price of oil was then set by the 661 committee, not by Saddam Hussein. Right. The, um, and, he and, and in some cases set below market price. No, the, the, is, it was when it was set at the beginning of the month, when the market moved, it, it ended up being below market price, which is why the U.S. and the United Kingdom moved to set the price at the end of the month so that, so that he could not take advantage of, those, uh, of, the, um, of the natural market shifts. Yes, sir. Yeah. What, and so I'm getting to my point. What concerns me is that you basically have um, described to me uh, the reality that um, our allies who didn't support the embargo were pretty much shaping it. And that that was the reality of, 
of this program and that it was more important to have the program happen even if in a way, not if, even if in a way, even though it wasn't working properly. In other words, having the program and not having work properly was, was better than not having the program at all. And I conclude from that because you felt the only alternative was uh, that we would continue to see Iraqis starve and they wouldn't get the medicine. And I, and I guess that's your, the conclusion of the State Department. I think, sir, if, if the Iraqi, if there had been massive starvation in Iraq, I think the belief at that time, and Certainly. I was not there, was that the entire sanction regime totally would have collapsed, and then Saddam Hussein would have had no sanction regimes to have to deal with at all. Right. And that, that free reign would have been not in the U.S. national interest. Okay. But the bottom line is, as a result, we had uh, Saddam able to make a fortune uh, in kickbacks. That was basically the compromise. And, and, and it, it, it is a fact that the United States knew this was happening. Every time, sir, that we saw him move to abuse the system, pricing oil, kickbacks, we moved to try to counter that in the 661 committee and, as you rightly noted earlier, sir, met resistance from other member states. Who could veto? Yes, sir. The way the way the uh, the, res the way the uh, Security Council procedures work. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Ambassador, are you set to ask questions? Would you like to ask some questions? Yes. Thank you. We have two ambassadors here. I'm a bit confused. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Because I just heard you say that every time you saw something that it appeared abusive that uh, there would be some response. However, we've been told how Saddam Hussein had taken the money intended for uh, the people and food and uh, built magnificent palaces. Uh, it seems to me that there would be the time that uh, some action should have been taken. Can you respond, please? There, there is no doubt, uh, Madam Ambassador, that, uh, that, uh, that Saddam Hussein received kickbacks. So that, that is a fact. We moved to counter those, those kickbacks. But during this period of time, while he was making kickbacks, and as I testified before this committee uh, several months ago, what he did was on very large quantities of, of goods. And he remember, he was feeding a nation of some 23 to 25 million people, he would attempt to get very small kickbacks on very large sums, but the, the, the sums mount up over, over that kind of volume. He was receiving those, those funds, yet the, the medicines and the foodstuffs were still going in. I am not defending what he was doing by any means. What he was doing is wrong. But the food and medicines were going in, and he was getting the kickbacks while we and, and our United Kingdom allies moved to cut off either his attempt to manipulate oil prices or attempt to add surcharges or attempt to add after-sales service contracts. And so we took steps to block him to, to the, as soon as we discovered it. And as, as we've discussed earlier, we were not we were not successful in blocking all his activities. I, and I know, Mr. Ambassador, how difficult this is. I've been there, too. However, I think you're the only one that can help uh, our understanding of what went wrong so long. And so I understand that the Oil for Food program helped provide food for 27 million Iraqi residents it prevented malnutrition, it reduced communicable diseases, it eradicated polio, and was a major success for a period of time. Uh, 
we're focusing on 4.4 billion of a 67 billion humanitarian uh, success story. So do you believe that this program met its objectives and do you believe that we as the United States and the monitors who were participating uh, were on the job? Uh, I need to know out in the field what it was that was lacking and how we lost so much of the fund to corruption. What was it that should have been done beyond what you've just described? The, the Oil for Food program had multiple objectives. One objective was to ensure that foods, medicine, and other essential human needs of the Iraqi people were met. And so, in that extent, it met its objective by ensuring that infant mortality rate and maternal mortality rate, which had gone up, went back down, and nutrition was, got, was achieved by the Iraqi people. So, that, yes, it met that objective. But in terms of being a sanctioned regime that stopped any attempt by Saddam Hussein to bust the sanctioned regime and achieve and keep him from, from cheating on the sanctioned regime, busting it, and then potentially using those funds to get other materials. It was, it was not a total success. But the gentle lady suspend a second. Could I just yeah. When you say any attempt, and it was not a total success, as it relates to that part of it, you seem to be going back and suggesting that the abuses were infrequent. Is it your no. testimony that the abuses were infrequent? We've no. already conceded no. that people are going to get aid, they're going to get money and medicine. But on the other side of the equation, is it your testimony that it was just any attempt, we didn't succeed in any, was this a problem that ha were the abuses more frequent, have been more than less. I want to know which way you see it. The, the abuses, Mr. Chairman, were continuous. Thank you. But they were, if I might, sir, they were different abuses each time. I mean, he abused it with oil smuggling outside the program. He abused it with kickbacks. He abused it with premiums on oil. He Fine. took different steps. So continuous abuse, different tools that he used each time to, to cause the abuses, sir. Thank you. Thank you. If uh, I may continue, and um, if you want to uh, continue to respond to my last question, fine. But let me raise another issue. Uh, what other UN bilateral or multilateral mechanism besides the 661 committee could the United States have utilized to publicize and put an end to these practices? I am concerned that too much of the oil monies were diverted in other directions and those who suffered were the Iraqi people. With the coalition, what could have been done to end this misuse? With, the, uh, with Saddam Hussein as the figure here, I don't know that anything would have stopped Saddam Hussein from attempting to, to get around any activity. Let me just ask you this, then what would have stopped the flow of funds? The only, into the program, Oil for Food? The only thing that would have stopped it would have been if you had had a different sanctions regime, but the sanction regime that was put into place was the one that was the result of long, extensive, and arduous negotiations with other member states to achieve that sanctioned regime. If you had had a regime in which, again, hypothetically, a company had pumped all the oil sold all the oil, and bought all the goods and sent them in, then there might not have been 
any leakage, as you describe. However, there was not the political will on the part of nations to impose that kind of a sanctions regime. What of, of our uh, political will here? Did we make a strong enough effort, Security Council in the, U in the UN, to bring their attention and get a focus on possibly changing the kind of structure that we had? Uh, from my, I was what was being done from I, within? I was not, I mean, I only arrived at the United Nations, the U.S. mission to the United Nations in, in the fall of 2001. But my preparation for this, my reading of, of, of a very extensive record, indicate that the U.S. government made extensive efforts to, to get a, the, most, uh, the most teeth into sanctions that it could and met, met resistance from other, from other member states who were unwilling to accept, mm -hmm. to accept that. I understand how difficult it is when you're coming in and programs like this have been running. That is the reason why we were concerned on this committee with our oversight and we wanted to see what records, what documentation, what facts there are held by other uh, departments and branches. I understand uh, that there were 60 staffers in five different U.S. agencies who reviewed each of the oil for food contracts. If we had that information, then my questions might be answered. And uh, I want to thank you for your service, and I want to thank you for coming here, being on the hot seat. But I think there should be some others that are on the hot seat so we can find where we went wrong, where it went wrong. We know that Saddam Hussein was wrong, but uh, that doesn't excuse this whole thing. And so we just like to get to the bottom of it. I appreciate your service. Thank and you. uh, thank you so much for trying to explain what happened before you. your duty started. But we're trying to seek truth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Just very briefly, Ambassador. Um, do you feel this story should come out? Absolutely. Do you feel this story should come out even if it embarrasses our allies? Absolutely. Do you believe it should come out even if it embarrasses some allies and makes it more difficult to get their cooperation in Iraq? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to go to our next panel. Thank you. We're going to go to a new panel. Our next panel, our last panel, and um, many hours later, uh, David Smith, Director, Corporate Banking Operations, BNP Paribas, Peter W. G. Box. Managing Director, Sayboat International, BV, and uh, Andre Pruneau, Senior Vice President, Africa and Middle East, Cotecna Inspections, um, SA. You would all stay standing. We'll swear you in. Is there anyone who, if there's someone else who might respond to a question, I would like them to, um, to uh, be able to um, be sworn in as well. So we have David Smith, Peter Box, and uh, Andre Pruneau. Thank you. And we swear in all our witnesses, if you'd raise your right hand, please, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth. Note for the record, our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your patience. And also, thank you for your cooperation. You all have been very cooperative. You all have uh, tried to uh, be consistent with your obligations, but enable us to do our job as well, and we thank you for that. Um, uh, David Smith, we're going to have you go first. I'll just go down, and I, you'll need to bring that mic closer to you. So you need to kind of, yeah, that's it. Bring it down a little further. And uh, it, the light's on means your, uh, your uh, mic is on. You want to just tap it just to see. 
So uh, what we'll do is you have the floor for five minutes and then we roll it over for another five minutes. Uh, after 10, I'll, I'd ask you to stop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Chairman Shays, members of the committee, I request that my written statement be submitted for the record. And it will without objection. Thank you. Before responding to any particular inquiries members of this committee may have, I would like to make a brief statement which summarizes the key points of my written statement to the committee. My name is David Smith. Since September 2001, I have been employed by BNP Paribas North America, where I serve as Director of Corporate Banking Operations. In that capacity, I have been responsible for overseeing the bank's letter of credit processing operations, including those operations as they pertain to the bank's agreement to provide banking services to the United Nations for the UN's Oil for Food program. First, as to the selection of BNP. According to a report of the General Secretary dated November 25, 1996, the selection process for the holder of the UN Iraq account began with the preparation of, and I quote, a working list of major banks in all parts of the world with the necessary credit quality ratings, strong capital positions, and capabilities to provide the services necessary for the account, close quote. The report indicates that a short list of those banks, including BNP, were asked in June 1996 to submit written proposals to the UN for the provision of the required banking services. The UN's request for proposals sought certain pricing information from each bank and inquired into each bank's capabilities to handle the business of the program's size. The bank understands that four major international banks submitted formal off offers in response to the RFP. The General Secretary reported in 1996 that, and I quote, after careful consideration of the proposals received, close quote, BMP was selected on June 18, 1996 to be the holder of the UN Iraq account. Accordingly, a banking services agreement was executed by BMP and the United Nations after several weeks of negotiations. The bank believes that several factors resulted in BMP's selection by the UN, including the following. One, its large international presence. Two, its significant position in the commodities trade finance business. Three, its high credit rating. Four, its strong capital position. Five, its willingness to assume the credit risk of other banks by confirming the oil letters of credit to be issued for the benefit of the program. Six, its competitive pricing. And seven, its substantial trade finance support operation located in New York City, where the UN is headquartered. Secondly, as to the services the bank has provided to the UN, the role of the bank under the Banking Services Agreement has consisted of delivering non-discretionary banking services to its customer, the United Nations. These services have related to both the oil and the humani humanitarian sides of the program. Generally on the oil side of the program, those services have involved the confirmation of letters of credit issued on behalf of UN-approved purchases of Iraqi oil. Those letters of credit were issued by various banks for the benefit of the UN Iraq account. When a bank confirms a letter of credit, it takes upon itself the obligation to pay the beneficiary, here the UN. The bank's confirmation of the oil letters of credit was done at the request of the UN. It was performed in accordance with standard banking practices, letters of credit practices, with several additional controls imposed by the UN as described in my written statement. On the humanitarian side of the program, the bank's services have involved the issuance of letters of credit at the direction of the UN for the benefit of UN-approved suppliers of goods to Iraq. Those letters of credit provided the necessary assurance to suppliers that they would receive payment for their goods once they had been delivered to Iraq in accordance with their contractual obligations. Their processing by the bank was performed in accordance with standard letter of credit practice with a number of additional controls, again, has, as detailed in my written statement. Significantly, the bank has had no discretion over how money has been spent or invested under the program. The bank did not select the buyers of the oil, sellers of the goods, or the goods to be supplied. 
Third, as to the bank's legal and ethical obligations. The bank's provision of services pursuant to the Banking Services Agreement was licensed by the United States Department of Treasury Office for Foreign Asset Control, or OFAC. Moreover, all services provided by the bank under the agreement were performed within a framework designed by the UN. Under the agreement, the UN, a universally known international organization of sovereign states, was the bank's sole customer. As I have stated, all aspects of the transaction under the program, including the purchases of oil and the suppliers of goods, as well as the nature, amount and pricing of goods involved, were approved by the UN. All letters of credit confirmed or issued by the bank under the Banking Services Agreement were governed by the Uniform Customs and Practices for Documentary Credits, a set of detailed procedures for letter of credit published by the International Chamber of Commerce. Program transactions were also subject to US regulatory requirements, including in particular the screening of any program participant against lists of specially designated nationals published by OFAC. There were also, sorry, there also were, as described in my written statement, a number of additional controls imposed by the UN that were unique to the program. Notably, an article in past Saturday's New York Times purports to quote from a briefing paper provided to the members of this committee that suggests that the bank was remiss because it, quote, never, initiate, never initiated a review of the program or the reputation of those involved, close quote. Any such suggestion misunderstands the nature of the bank's role under its banking services agreement with the UN. Under that agreement, the UN was the bank's sole customer. The bank reasonably relied upon the sanctions committee of the Security Council for its review and approval of both purchases of oil and the suppliers of goods. The bank provided specified non-discretionary non services to the UN under the banking services agreement and it was not the bank's place to substitute its judgment for that of the Sanctions Committee regarding who would be approved by the UN to participate in the program. Fourth, as to the unique challenges of the program. From a banking perspective, the program has represented an enormously challenging and unique undertaking, involving the process of over 23,000 letters of credit and the disbursement of billions of dollars for investment purposes at the direction of the UN. Those investments have generated in excess of $2.7 billion for the benefit of the program. With the exception of a temporary backlog in processing of humanitarian letters of credit in mid-2000, mid the bank believes that it has done a good job in handi handling the highly demanding banking assignment under a program of unprecedented scope and magnitude. Finally, as to the design of the program, the bank believes that the use of letters of credit provided the correct banking framework for the program. Although outside the scope of our responsibilities, it appears with the benefit of hindsight that the program might have been better structured in other respects to minimize the risk of abuse. In this regard, a well-managed competitive business pro a well-managed competitive bidding process, both for the purchase of oil and for the sale of goods, might have been substituted for what was essentially a sole source pro procurement process. This would have eliminated the role of the government Iraq in the selection of prospective counterparties for UN approved oil and goods transactions and would have provided greater transparency regarding program participants. It might also have reduced the possibility that the program might not always have received the most favorable pricing. On behalf of BNP Paribas, I thank the committee for this opportunity to provide this statement. I would be happy to respond to any questions members of the committee may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Mr. Box. Hit, if you hit that button here, I think you'll... Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the subcommittee, <coughs> My name is uh, Peter Box. I'm an executive of Sabelt International, which is headquartered in the Netherlands, just outside of Rotterdam. Thank you for inviting me to discuss with the subcommittee today the role of Sabelt International in the administration of the United Nations Oil for Food Program. Having submitted a more complete statement, for the record, I'll discuss my brief oral remarks on our principal responsibility.
namely the monitoring of oil exports under the Alpha Food Program. Uh, Mr. Chairman, please bear with me that English is not my native uh, language, no, so please excuse me uh, if things are unclear. Let me, let me assure you that we hear you very well and we appreciate that you are speaking in English, so thank okay. you. Sabot won its contract with the United Nations in 1996 through a competitive bid process. Under that contract and multiple extensions, Sabot deployed teams of inspectors selected on the basis of their prior experience in the industry. All inspectors were screened by Sabolt, approved by the United Nations, trained and briefed for this assignment, and required to certify compliance with Sabolt's code of conduct. Under its contract with the United Nations, Sabolt's responsibility was to monitor the quantity and quality of oil exports from the two authorized oil for food export points, the offshore platform Mina al Bakr and the port of Chehan in Turkey along with a remote monitoring station on the Iraq-Turkey pipeline near Zako, close to the northern border with Turkey. The oil monitoring worked as follows. First, the United Nations oil overseers would review and approve contracts and letters of credit negotiated between the Iraqi national oil company SOMO and the buyers of Iraqi oil. Coordinating through a common database shared by Sabolt and the United Nations, Sabolt would then monitor the quantity and quality of oil pursuant to the approved contracts at the two authorized export points and reporting confirming figures to the United Nations. Also important were the limits of Sabolt's responsibilities. Sabolt had no responsibility, for example, with respect to the underlying contracts, which were negotiated directly between the seller and the buyer and reviewed by the United Nations. Sabolt had no control over the monies that were involved in the underlying transactions. That was a matter for the seller, the buyers, and the United Nations. Nor did Sabolt itself buy or sell Iraqi oil. Finally, although from time to time we reported irregularities that we observed to the United Nations or the multilateral interception force, Sabolt had no responsibility for monitoring oil exports from any other locations than the three locations specified in its contract. In performing their responsibilities, Sabolt inspectors typically operated in remote locations, in hospitable work environments. Some days, for example, the isolated Mina al Bakr platform was without electricity or water, and sometimes during heat that exceeded 110 degrees. UN audits and reports confirmed the harsh working conditions and risk to personal safety. The entire program was also characterized by highly charged political interests and sensitivities. The simultaneous operation of the humanitarian oil for food program and a comprehensive UN-imposed sanctions regime created a variety of practical and logistical complications, affecting everything from obtaining visas to paying for basic necessities. The job of monitoring authorized oil exports was also made more challenging by the poor state of the oil industry infrastructure and the deficiencies in equipment and technology in Iraq. Even before the program began, Sabled informed the United Nations of problems with the metering equipment at each of the three sites. For Mina al Bakr, the Iraqi failure to install, repair or calibrate metering equipment meant that there were no counterpart measurements to cross-check against ship measurements at the point of loading on the Mina al Bakr platform. In the absence of calibrated shore tank and meters, Sabolt used the best alternative techniques accepted and widely used in the, M in the industry. Specifically in the absence of metering, inspectors relied on calibration charts, vessel experience factors and shipboard measurements to determine the quantity of oil loaded onto vessels, a methodology that united nations expressly accepted. Monitoring loadings without access to reliable meters is accepted industry practice, but is less accurate than metering at loading points. Although falsification of calibration charts and VEF data is rarely an issue, the possibility exists. To avoid such a problem, Sabolt originally recommended that the volume of oil be measured at the forum part of unloadings, as well as in the loading ports as Minal Bakker in Chehan. For whatever reasons, this recommendation was not adopted. In January 1999, following discussions with the United Nations, Sabolt began requiring that each vessel master sign a statement certifying the accuracy of the records provided to Sabolt. The United Nations was informed of this procedure and supported its implementation. Over seven years, 
Stable inspectors monitored more than 2,600 loadings involving a total of approximately 3.4 billion barrels of crude oil. Over that period of time, very few irregularities occurred. Two instances of loading excess quantities of oil, the unauthorized topping off, occurred in 2001, both involving the same vessel, the same vessel charter. charter. Sabled promptly investigated these incidents, made written and in-person reports to the United Nations, and put in place additional safeguards to prevent any similar abuses in the future. Thereafter, Sable encountered no recurrences of the two incidents experienced in 2001. Looking back on the program and the variety of challenges it faced, we can now identify ways that the monitoring of oil exports under the Alpha Food program might have been strengthened. These include requiring accurate metering equipment, the continuous presence of at least one UN official at each loading location, incorporating from the outset various safeguards that Sabled developed during the course of the program, and monitoring mechanism for detecting unauthorized exports from other than the two UN approved export points. More broadly, it now appears in hindsight that the ability for Iraq to contract directly, directly with buyers of oil and sellers of goods introduced a significant opportunity for abuse. And to the extent that the member states of the United Nations disregarded or systematically violated the UN embargo against Iraq, that conduct obviously undercut fundamentally the objectives of the Alpha Food Program, which was conceived to be an exception to that embargo. Sabled and its professionals performed a difficult job under very difficult circumstances in Iraq. While not without blemishes, the monitoring of oil was done professionally over an extended period of time. I'm happy to discuss that project with you today and to help extract from that experience any lessons that will be of value in conducting other humanitarian programs in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Box. Um, Mr. Pruneau, thank you. I, I think the mic, thank you. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of, of the subcommittee, my name is André Pruneau. Since 1998, I've been employed as Senior Vice President of Cotecna Inspection in Geneva, Switzerland, which has some 4,000 personnel in over 100 offices around the world. I sincerely appreciate having the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee today to clearly establish for the public record the difficult task of Cotecna as a contractor under the UN Oil for Food Program. Mr. Chairman, my primary duties at Cotecna consisting of managing operations in Africa and the Middle East as summarized in my CV included in my prepared statement. We hope to clarify today Cotecna's responsibilities and authority under the Oil for Food program and the CPI contracts. The documents we provided to the subcommittee clearly demonstrate our performance under these contracts has been fully consistent with our obligations. Since the inception of its contract in Iraq, Cotecna has authenticated the arrival of goods in Iraq worth a total of 29 billion US dollars, of which no single authentication has proven erroneous. To fairly judge our performance, you must first understand, Mr. Chairman, what services Cotecna was and was not contracted to perform under the OFF program. Cotecna was not hired to perform inspection services in the traditional sense, which would normally entail a broad range of tasks in support of, custom, of food customs inspection service services, including, for instance, price analysis, quality, quality inspection at port of origin and or port of destination. The 92 request for proposal on which Cotecna was a successful bidder issued by the, by the UN did incorporate broader, more traditional customs inspection mandates. That contract was never awarded, however, because the Iraqi government would not give its consent. A subsequent contract was awarded in 1996 to Lloyd's Register and included the narrower scope of responsibility and authority for authentication of goods under the 986 OFF program. The parameters of this contract were originally established by the Security Council working with the UNOIP and Lloyd's. In 1998, Cotecna presented the strongest technical proposal at the lowest price and on that basis was awarded the contract, succeeding Lloyd's. Importantly, the term authentication in this context is unique to the UNOIP contract. 
In the world of customs inspection services, the term authentication does not appear. This reflects the limited role under the contract of authenticating the arrival of approved and permitted shipments in Iraq so the suppliers could be paid. Under the narrow scope of the contract, Kotekna played a limited technical role in verifying that goods entering Iraq matched the list of goods authorized for importation. And in the case of foodstuffs, assessing their fitness for human consumption. Our prepared testimony includes these details. Conversely, Kotekna was not involved in selecting the goods to be imported, establishing the specifications of such products, selecting the suppliers, negotiating the prices to be paid or designating any sales intermediaries or sales commissions. Further, Kotekna was not involved in handling any funds for the payment for any goods, but only with verifying that items which had been approved for import had actually been delivered in Iraq. Mr. Chairman, it is important for the subcommittee to understand that two types of goods were coming into Iraq under UN authority and approval. The first set of goods entered the country under the Oil for Food Program, pursuant to Security Council Resolution 986. In addition, a separate volume of goods, valued by some to be worth double that of 986 goods, were imported under Security Council Resolution 661. These 661 goods were the subject of private contracting they were not financed by the OFF program, and therefore Kotekna had neither responsibility nor authority to either authenticate or inspect them. Under the contract, Kotekna authenticated 100% of shipments entering Iraq under the 986 program and was required to perform physical examination on up to 10% of these bulk and containerized imports, with the exception of quality control testing of food basket items, as I have already mentioned. We consistently fulfilled each of these mandates. The company was operating in a difficult and challenging physical and political environment as detailed in part four of my prepared written statement. Relations with the UN Office of the Humanitarian Coordinator for Iraq, UNOCHI, in Baghdad were sometimes difficult because Kotekna was required to di report directly to OIP only, while UNOCHI Baghdad was assisting Kotekna in Iraq for logistics, visas, transportation authorizations, and complaints from the Iraqi authorities related to Kotekna activities and inspectors. Also, the relationship with UN humanitarian agencies was delicate and a source of tension because these humanitarian agencies adopted a more sympathetic attitude towards Iraqi and Kurdish entities. Ultimately, UNOCHI arranged, for instance, and presided over monthly coordination meetings in Baghdad between these humanitarian agencies and Kotekna. Congestion in the port of Umkasser also became a very serious problem with suppliers, and suppliers be began to complain of the record that the government was refusing to remove containers from the port unless they paid a fee to the Iraqi port authority, as the government sought to influence the authentication payment process for financial gain. In direct response to concerns raised by Kotekna to UNOIP, this process stopped and the congestion situation immediately eased. Iraq frequently exerted, exerted pressure on Kotekna to withhold or retract authentication. Kotekna was directed under the contract to refer all such matters to UNOIP New York. But this did not alleviate the pressure from the government, particularly in Umkasser. Mr. Chairman, Kotekna has consistently performed its limited technical role in the authentication of goods under the 986 off program under the most difficult and political and physical conditions. In so doing, the company strictly adhered to its contractual responsibilities and fulfilled its obligation as established and implemented by the UN Security Council. When there were problems, and there were many, Mr. Chairman, the company reported those problems. We have sought to cooperate with the subcommittee and have provided full documentation of these communications to you. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I would be pleased to answer any questions members of the subcommittee might have. I would respectfully ask that my full statement be included in the record, along with a letter I sent to you on October 1st regarding an article that appeared in the New York Post. Thank you. We have that one. Yeah. Um, your letter and uh, all of your statements will be in the record uh, in their entirety. Uh, without objection, that will happen. Uh, let me start with uh, the professional staff, uh, with the council, to ask some questions, and then I'll have some questions. You need to talk right in the mic. Right. 
Mr. Smith, um, in describing the factors that you say led the United Nations to select BNP as the provider of banking services, um, you, you said an established commercial trade operation in New York. What did that include? Uh, facilities for processing letters of credit of the of the kind that the program generated. The the program in itself was unique. It's on. The program in itself was unique. Um, I don't I don't think that um, any bank had got facilities established to to process the type of business that was created by the program itself. However, BMP had had got an existing trade finance operation which dealt with the issuance of letters of credit in New York City. Could you just explain could you just explain what made it unique? The uh, potentially the size of the program um, which was obviously a little bit unclear at the start of, of the the actual program um, but especially the additional controls that were included the um, confirmations of arrival um, are unique. As far as I'm aware, they're not used anywhere else as far as letters of credit are concerned. Normally, a supplier of goods under a letter of credit would be paid as soon as they presented all of the required documents under the letter of credit, which is usually at the, por at the point they ship the goods. Under this program, no payment is possible until the goods have actually arrived in Iraq and been inspected and confirmed to be in accordance with the contract. So that, that complicated the process, both in terms of paper and time, is that correct? That certainly contact, um, complicated the process. It gave us an additional amount of paper that we had to check against the letter of credit and the shipping right. documents that were being presented for payment. In that line of business with your client, the UN, um, when does the bank get paid and for, based on what triggering event? The, um, the bank basically gets paid for the issuance of the letter of credit. Uh, there are some associated fees relating um, to pure payments, to um, swift messages, etc. But the, the actual fees charged under the program really related to the issuance of letters of credit. The, the offer for program was run in phases, uh, des designated by the the Office of the Iraqi Program, is that correct? It was run in six-month phases, yes, sir. Right. And d did business practices or the bank's approach to this change phase to phase? I'm understanding where there were negotiations with the Iraqi government and other entities from phase to phase as the program matured. Did, how did that change the bank's operating? As, as far as the bank was concerned, the banking services agreement was basically extended by the, the United Nations at each stage during the process. Um, to the best of my knowledge, during the course of a series of extensions over what eventually were 13 phases of the program, there were some changes made to the way uh, the business was conducted. Mm -hmm. And as, as the processing or the flow of business changed, what kind of capacity did the bank have to discern trends or anomalies in, in the business? For example, it's been suggested that about phase eight, when Saddam got a little more sophisticated about uh, oil vouchers as opposed to directly selling to end users, that the roster of those being paid would have changed both in quantity and in, in quality, new people and a new number of people. Would that have been discernible by the bank and would it have put a red light on the board anywhere for any reason? There was certainly an increase in the volume and especially in the complexity of the business that the bank was handling um, around about phase eight. As far as um, red flags are concerned, I would come back to my statement in that the United Nations was the bank's customer, the United Nations was approving all of the counterparties under both the oil and the humanitarian contracts. In addition to that, I would also remind you that uh, all of this business was screened for OFAC purposes and reviewed against the, the various OFAC listings. Mm -hmm. So with, with those safeguards in place, the bank felt confident that its, its business is being done uh, according to the rules. But what, what, in other senses, what can go wrong with a letter of credit? What would send a, a bell or red light off in a letter of credit transaction? The, um, sorry, that, 
most of the immediate thoughts that, that come to mind with that question are purely from an operational point of view mm -hmm. in, in how we check documents, et cetera, et cetera, um, which would not really be caused under the, the program. Um, I mean, if, if, if the recipient of the shipment says, this is not the quality or quantity of oil I ordered, and there's a rejection, then well, the letter of credit is not claimed upon, and, and you have no... The, the letter of credit is, an ob uh, is a written undertaking that a payment will be made on the presentation of documents that are specified within that letter of credit. So a letter of credit is constructed so that the buyer of the goods ensures that they have the necessary documents to give them the comfort that the goods are of the quality that they want, of the quantity that they want, and will be delivered in a, in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, on the oil that was being lifted from Iraq, the, some, one of the documents that would need to be presented for payment would be a chemical analysis of the goods or, or, or of the oil to pr prove it was of a specific quality. Quality. Mm -hmm. In addition, bills of lading confirming the shipment and the quantity of the shipment would also be presented. Okay. So the protection is in the documents which the bank is dealing mm -hmm. with. In the course of these transactions, did BNP have occasion to be in contact for any reason with the Central Bank of Iraq? The bank received its, uh, it received the initial requests to issue letters of credit under the humanitarian program from the Central Bank of Iraq. Once those requests were received, they were referred to the United Nations, um, and the United Nations would give the, uh, the approval to issue those letters of credit or not. As far as the inspection of the documents before payment is concerned, there would be no contact with the Central Bank of Iraq. The bank would review those documents, check those documents in the same way that it would under any other commercial transaction, albeit with the additional documents and controls that are included in this program, and make a determination of whether a payment should be made. If the bank was comfortable that the documents were in order and a payment should be made, then we would approach the UN telling them that we had good documents and we were proposing to make a payment. They would confirm that payment. And at that end of the process, the, the Central Bank of Iraq had no say as to who or how much got paid? That, that is correct. Okay. Once the, the letter of credit is issued, it governs the, the conditions of payment. And as long as the correct documents are presented, then payment should follow. Thank you. Mr. Pruneau, um, describe a little more, if, if you could, the distinction that's being made in your testimony between authentication and inspection. Uh, that our perception from both your testimony and other documents is that it was a process that compared paper to paper, and sometimes it didn't matter what was in the truck behind you, that if the paper you were sent saying this, this truck should contain 50 barrels of something, and the document handed you by the driver said this is 50 barrels of something, then your obligation was fulfilled and you never got to look in the truck. Is that correct? Well, authentication is really a matching documents so we would receive, you, you, know, you, you know that we were present at four sites, four border points. The fifth one uh, was opened in uh, 2002, but it ne really never operated. It was at the border between uh, Iraq and Saudi Arabia. The uh, documents were forwarded by the uh, UNOIP in New York in such a way that it was, uh, it provided uh, very detailed information on the goods which had been approved and uh, for which the uh, letters of approval had been issued. So the uh, suppliers would uh, uh, send the, uh, the goods, the shipments to Iraq, and uh, we would know beforehand that uh, the goods were going to arrive through this uh, confidential trans uh, transmission of uh, information and data coming from the UNOIP and addressed to s each individual site. Uh, no one uh, let me phrase that, phrase that differently. The information provided to, the, to a certain site like, like Al Walid was not available to the other sites to keep confidentiality. Now, for instance, at Trebil, where we had most of the traffic, the trucks will arrive with bulk cargo or containers, and they had to stop. And the suppliers and the transporters, that was their duty to come 
to us and tell us this is uh, the shipment so and so, these are the references, these are, these are all the documents, and we would look at all these documents and see if they matched the information we had received from uh, UNYP. And when they, when they didn't match, what happened? When it did not match, there were three sources, three, three, three major reasons that maybe the, the letter of approval had expired because it took more, more time for the, the goods to arrive in Iraq or to, to be presented at the border. Sometimes and very often the sites had changed, especially between Turkey and uh, goods landed in Turkey or in Aqaba in Jordan. So it's many of, uh, very often there was a substitution in sites. And sometimes the uh, documents uh, were incomplete. That was mostly the case in Umkasa. So we would block, block in the sense that we would not authenticate. But we had no uh, authority and, uh, and no, no power to prevent the truck from crossing the border and, uh, and entering into Iraq. The only thing is that nobody would be paid because we had not authenticated. In such a case, we would refer these problems to the uh, UNOIP and it was up to UNOIP to, to discuss with the supplier or find the, the reason or maybe extend the, the validity of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, approval. Did you, know what the re Did you know what the outcome was when you would disclose these transactions that had taken place? Do you know how they were resolved or once they were passed on to the UN authorities, that kind of left your hands? No, I would not know. I would not know. We would get a, an information from the uh, UNOIP that, uh, yes, indeed, uh, the approval has been uh, extended, that uh, uh, the, it was acceptable that the site be changed, and that the supplier was requested to provide the, uh, the, the missing documents. And then, on that basis, on that, basis, on that uh, uh, very specific uh, uh, information or even request from UNOIP, we would authenticate by uh, electronic email that was at the, uh, in 2002, but before that it was faxed and signed by the team leader on each of the site, and it was sent to uh, UNYP and Treasury so that the payment of the supplier could be processed. In that regard, in your testimony, you say the Iraqi ministries complained continuously that the authentication process favored the supplier, often claiming that they had received substandard goods or delivery shortfalls Iraq frequently exerted firm pressure on Kotechna to withhold or retract authentication. OIP directed Kotechna to refer all such matters to the UN. What does that mean? The OIP is the UN. To the UN Security Council. Where did that get you? Let me be, maybe I misunderstood. Now. Do you understand? His question was what did that what happened? What happened then? What, ha what was achieved by doing that? We, if we, uh, the, the Iraqi uh, authorities, for instance in Umkasser, that's the place where we, they would put us under pressure. If I understand your question, if the Iraqi authorities would complain that uh, we were authenticating goods which were sub-quality, we would not get involved in this kind of uh, discussions as long as the goods, speaking of foodstuffs, were fit for human consumption. If they had entered Iraq, and uh, the territory of Iraq, the crossing the border and, or crossing the gate of the port of Umkasa, we would authenticate and the supplier would be paid. Now, the fact that uh, the Iraqis considered that the goods were substandard or that uh, were not exactly what they had uh, ordered was a, a matter of a commercial dispute between a supplier and a, and, uh, and a receiver. In fact, we, b being in the, in the business, in the profession of uh, commercial inspection, we, we, we always told everyone that it is normal practice in this kind of uh, business, in commercial transactions, to appoint an independent inspection company to verify that the goods uh, which are being purchased match the, uh, the contract, the detailed contract specifications. And that was constantly uh, told by the UNOIP to the Iraqi authorities to, to uh, implement this kind of uh, procedure. But they chose not to? They did that on, uh, occasionally. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to mention, for instance, that uh, one of the things we were, Kotechna was forbidden was 
We were forbidden for, from acting as a commercial inspection company, providing our services to, of course, Iraqi importers and, of course, to uh, the suppliers. So there would be no conflict of interest between the independent inspection authentication that we were providing to the UNOIP and the potential commercial disputes between the receiver and the supplier. That was a prohibition in, in your contract with yes. the UN? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, your testimony also says that one of the challenges you faced in executing this contract is that you had to navigate Kotechna's delicate web of contacts with UN's Office of the Humanitarian Coordinator for Iraq. Could you amplify on that? There, there's other references in testimony that that, that particular office um, was a problem in terms of uh, executing this program. I would not say it was a problem. It was a delicate, uh, uh, a diplomatic way of uh, having to coordinate on a daily basis in Iraq because we had from 54 to 67 inspectors living and working and traveling and, uh, and uh, eating and sleeping in Iraq. And uh, you have to realize also that to get into Iraq, uh, you, have, you need a visa to enter the, uh, the territory. And the visas were provided only at the uh, embassy of uh, Iraq in uh, Amman, in Jordan. And if for some reason the visa was not granted, then uh, we, the inspectors would be stranded in, uh, in Amman and incapable of reaching their sites. Now, the only way to, to uh, get some support to clear visas of to get transportation uh, authorizations to travel also in Iraq, you needed a very specific author authorization. And that was provided also by the Iraqi authorities. And the interface between the Iraqi authorities for all these problems of logistics and transportation was uh, handled by the Office of the uh, Humanitarian Coordinator, UNOCHI, in Baghdad. Uh -huh. now, also, and more importantly, the, uh, a lot of complaints came from the Iraqis, justified or unjustified, on the behavior of certain of our inspectors, uh, on uh, things which, have, which could have happened on some of the sites which had been reported to the Iraqi officials, and also on complaints on the, uh, the, the performance of Kotechna, especially in Umkasser, where we were put under extreme pressure uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, shorten some of the uh, delays that uh, they, they were experiencing. In such a case, uh, I have to be frank, the uh, UNOCHI was adopting a uh, rather uh, friendly attitude towards the, uh, the request from the uh, Iraqi right. authorities. And this is what I mean. Problem might not be the right word, but uh, your delicate attention is uh, right. correct. Well, sounds like a problem to me. Um, and I, you also say that you had to deal with direct pressure from the Iraqis, and I need you to describe that a little more because I'm going to go next to Mr. Box about that same issue. What, what kind of pressure? Uh, there's some documents and, and some uh, email traffic we got from you that describes pressure to, to move things through and, and uh, keep the pace going and, and not be so careful about things. Uh, where did that pressure come from and what did you do about it? That's for you. For me? Oh, from uh, Iraqi officials. Uh, we have an example which is uh, uh, presented in the documents you have received where it was in 1999 uh, there was a ministry or the minister of, uh, I think it was of trade, who came with armored guy, guards at uh, our camp, our site in Umkasser, and uh, told us uh, that we would not be authorized to uh, authenticate uh, unless the goods are, had already been uh, accepted in terms of uh, quality by the uh, Baghdad laboratories. And, uh, as reported uh, in uh, various correspondences which appear in the document, the uh, inspectors were very shaken on the, on the ground. And uh, so we uh, issued, that came to my attention in, uh, in Geneva, and uh, we told the uh, UNYP in New York. And, uh, and, uh, but th there was permanently pressure of these kind of things. Right. And uh, in two well, I mean, what would have been the problem with, with Baghdad checking off on the acceptance of goods? Oh, they would have blocked all, of, all of the authentication, but uh, for until, me... Until they got paid first, was that the suspicion? Yes, yes, and yeah. create a bottleneck so that somebody would have to pay to get uh, the, uh, the goods cleared uh, by uh -huh. uh, financial gains to Iraqi officials. 
And so after that incident, after the, the Minister of Trade shows up with 20 or more armed guards and, and intimidates your crew, you report to the UN what happened and when did it happen? How was that demand resolved? Diplomatically or politically, I cannot respond. I can tell you that technically, technically uh, that problem was solved because with that did not happen again. But however, as I said before, the, uh, there were constant pressure, especially in Umkasa, on the uh, on uh, on Kotekna to uh, uh, to aut authenticate in a uh, in a speedy or or in a slow way so that uh, the uh, Iraqi officials could uh, have uh, exercise some pressure on the suppliers. Okay. Mr. Box. Um, there was a, an allegation in the Wall Street Journal two days ago that in, in the course of one uh, oil transaction, a Sable employee had been bribed to allow the topping off of the ship. Um, the company's response at the time was that it had been investigated before and found nothing, but you're looking again. Do you have anything more to say about that? Uh, yes. Uh, we have indeed investigated uh, that incident at the time, or, uh, let's say, when we uh, learned uh, of the incident, which was in October 2001. At that time, we conducted uh, a thorough investigation. Uh, we went through the whole process. Uh, we looked at both loadings. We interviewed uh, the team leader. We uh, uh, virtually uh, uh, took all the uh, events and circumstances. And um, we uh, submitted the, that report of the inv investigation to the United Nations uh, with a briefing also to the 661 committee. What we have now learned from the article in the Wall Street Journal uh, actually is for us a new allegation. We had no knowledge of that. Uh, before it was published. And you can rest assured that we will investigate this further. We will go to the bottom of it. And actually, as a matter of fact, our board has already uh, instructed our general counselor, together with a team of lawyers, to investigate this uh, up to the bottom. All right. If you could provide the subcommittee with whatever product your investigation produces, that would be helpful. Sure. We will share this uh, undoubtedly with, uh, what's say, the investigating uh, commissions. Thank you. The, uh, the incident of the Essex, which was uh, detained and found to have oil loaded in excess of the oil for food contract, um, what changes were made in the Sable inspection process and the UN process as a result of that? And well, what, oh, what, what confidence do you have that it, that it, it stopped the was effective in preventing the practice of topping off. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, at the evening I heard, um, basically we took immediate actions uh, for temporary reasons to have an inspector sitting 24 hours, seven days a week on board of a vessel if it was alongside the terminal. But given, I would say, uh, the staff levels, that was not something which we continue could continue. So we implemented uh, new instructions in terms of sealing the ship's manifold after the loading had been completed and the connection arms were disconnected. Uh, these uh, seal numbers, or let's say these seals would have unique numbers and would be also um, inserted on the notification letter. The notification letter uh, was a letter which we put on board with the UN authorized quantity loaded on board that specific vessel actually a procedure that only was implemented earlier in 2001. In addition to that, we would check the seals prior to the departure of a vessel, because a vessel would not always automatically depart immediately after it uh, completed its loading. So before departing, we would check the integrity of the seals. If not, we would then remeasure the vessel. Another instruction is that we would look at the draft of the vessel after its completed loading. Uh, the draft is, uh, I would say, the, the level of uh, the, the surface of the water and the keel of the vessel. Uh, in Minal Bakker, the maximum draft is uh, 21 meters. So if a vessel would load with less than that, we would take records of that and also again check it uh, prior to departure. Uh, basically, we would also look at uh, potential 
um, vessels that would leave, or let's say would still have earlet space after it had loaded its UN authorized volume. So if that would be the case, special attention would be required. And those uh, uh, new instructions have been adopted also by the 61 committee at some stage. The, okay. the, uh, the, the, the calibration and the measurement methods you described in your testimony, can, of the, what is it, 26,000 loadings you, you supervised, or how many were there? Uh, 2,600 loadings. 600. Yeah. Of those, I mean, how many were s validated by you based on less than the, the technical methods you would have preferred? Uh, you, you mean, uh, did we ever? Uh, I, I don't in your testimony, you say that you would prefer to have the, have the, the, the calibration of the, the. Oh, the, sure. The we meter, would have preferred to have the metering they system. Yeah. And you used other indirect methods to, to determine the amount of oil. Well, actually, oh, sorry. Um, the, the, the situation is as follows that uh, when we first came to Iraq and we did our fact finding mission, we came to the conclusion that there were no properly calibrated metering facilities in place. Actually, the border station at Zakko did not have even an, a metering station. So the Iraqis had to uh, cannibalize on the Syrian pipeline and, and build it there within a couple of weeks. Uh, generally spoken, the metering equipment has never, during the whole of a food program, uh, became on a level which would uh, be able to use them for fiscalization purposes. So all 2,600 loadings have been done by utilizing the method as I have described right. in and my and statement. In your experience, what's the, the potential margin of error in well, using a less yeah. reliable system? How much? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, actually, what we did is uh, we made a total comparison of all the volumes uh, we lifted from Turkey. In Turkey, we had, uh, I would say, a cross-check uh, possibility of measuring the short tanks prior to loading and after loading and then the volume could be calculated derived from those two measurements. And we did also the ship and with applying the uh, OBQ, or let's say minus OBQ and the vessel experience factor. And uh, of the 1.3 billion barrels which were loaded from that port, actually we found uh, a surplus even, a small surplus though, of 0.04%, which would lead us to believe that that method was applied very accurately and uh, I would say very professional. Mina al Bakr is a different story because we could not uh, cross-check. We didn't have any ability. We only could rely on the ship's figures by applying uh, the vessel experience factor. So I could not give any estimated figure as to the accuracy of those measurements. Although I would dare to say that the uh, percentages would be probably around Maximum 2%. 2%. Okay. And finally, for all three of you, what um, kind of oversight did you get on this contract with the UN from the UN? Were you the subject of an audit or an investigation or a, an inquiry by the Office of Internal Oversight of the UN? And if so, how often and what was the outcome? Mr. Smith. The, the, the bank provided um, daily statements of the UN Iraq account to the United Nations. Uh, they also had copies of all of the letters of credit that we were issuing, any amendments that were made to those letters of credit, and details of the payments. Um, from that, I understand that there were internal audits within the UN based on that information. As far as I'm aware, there was never um, a physical audit of the bank or the bank's premises in our conducting of the business. But certainly the bank, through perhaps other regulatory channels had lines of business audited that crossed oil for food transactions, is that correct? Uh, the bank in itself certainly had its own internal audits and external audits of all business units, which included the trade finance area that right. um, provided the support to the United Nations. Sorry, my answer was, no, was uh, meant that the uh, United you Nations you answer the question as a formal you did, audit you of, of the bank. Mr. Box. Well, in terms of audits, um, from what I know, the UN has audited us three times in total. At least I have seen three times a report, uh, or let's say uh, in two instances, we only got um, a requirement to answer a few questions. Uh, 
uh, which basically yeah, were for us uh, very easy to answer. And in one instance, uh, there was done a full uh, audit report uh, of which, let's say, there were quite a few comments and we had to, uh, I would say, go through them and, and answer them uh, point by point, which we obviously did. Thank you. Because of the nature of our activities, we had, uh, I would say, almost 24 hours coordination with the uh, UNYP New York. Uh, and the UNYP would uh, call directly from New York the sites to discuss uh, technical or, or even management matters, administrative matters on the sites. Uh, however, we were uh, audited several times, uh, maybe uh, every three to six months, one of the uh, senior customs officers from uh, UNOIP would go and visit the sites with or without uh, uh, the Cotegna contract manager. We had an organization where we had a contract manager in, uh, based in Amman and, an, a, and a shadow one in Geneva working with me. But we would uh, go with them or without them and they, and they would uh, conduct a technical and uh, complete audit on the sites. And we, as a consequence, we would have uh, meetings, uh, in, uh, regular meetings in New York every three months, and our meetings also uh, with the team leaders uh, in mostly in uh, Baghdad or in uh, Amman. So that, that was a, an ongoing exercise that we were uh, audited several times. This is for the operations. Thank you. Thank you. I have a number of questions that I'd like to go through. I don't think that it'll take us long to answer. And some of them just uh, simply not be relevant and, uh, in the end. Um, but since they're on my mind, I want to ask and get them out of my brain if they're not relevant. Um, why were transactions carried out in euros instead of dollars? A decision was made um, partway through the program to change the pricing and the settlement of the oil um, sales from US dollars to euros. That decision was made by the Security Council of the United Nations. So it was the Security Council and not um, Osama, uh, Saddam Hussein? Uh, the decision was made by the Security Council, sir. What, what sort of challenges, if any, did this present? In banking terms, the, the additional challenges were minimal. Um, whichever cu currency we are dealing with, whether it is US dollars or euros, uh, the process is basically the same. The physical payment process is slightly different, um, but again, it's a well-established process. And, and the charge that your bank would make would be the standard charge that is made on every transaction? Yes, pricing was agreed. Um, based on the transactions that were being undertaken on behalf of the, the United Nations. I'm, I'm told the bank did not begin an internal investigation of the Oil for Food program and allegations of be corruption began to emerge in 2001. One, is that true? And two, why not? The bank uh, undertakes regular reviews of the program. Um, if you're question relates to the, the rumors and the stories relating to overpricing. Um, Which turned out to be true. I mean, there were rumors that turned out to be true. Right. As from what the bank could see from the details it had, from the information it had for the letters of credit, from the documents that were presented, there was no evidence um, that we could see that substantiated anything that was happening. We were dealing with documents that were presented under a letter of credit, um, which determined what the amount of the payment was, and the payment was basically made to the beneficiary or their bankers. Anything that happened outside of the letter of credit arrangement, obviously, we had no knowledge of at all. So you weren't, your company wasn't really in the field. This was more papers crossed your desk and you we were dealing solely with paperwork, and we were dealing with it in Manhattan, in New York City. But bottom line, I mean, the, the, the fact is that when there were rumors that ultimately turned out to be true, the, the, you, your bank pretty much decided uh, that there wasn't sufficient um, knowledge to have you conduct your own internal investigation. We would certainly, from an operational point of view, um, look at whatever rumors were, were going around. Um, 
indeed quite often we would discuss them at um, what were reasonably frequent uh, operational communication meetings with the UN Treasury. Um, so I'm aware that the UN were also aware of those rumors. At the end of the day, as I said before, it was the Security Council that were sanctioning the, the various transactions. Did you, did you have um, a, a sense of the powers or lack thereof of Sabolt and Cotecna in terms of their capability to actually verify uh, transactions? We were obviously not on the, in the ground in Iraq, so obviously um, did not see their, their operations at all. We were being provided by, with certificates that were required under the letters of credit. And in fact, as far as the Cotecna certificates are concerned, they came to us directly from the, the UN. They, they didn't come through um, any direct route. And again, the, um, the Sabolt inspections uh, all the documentation for the payment of an LC relating to an oil shipment was presented to us by the United Nations. Do you, um, Mr. Box, Bach, do you um, have any reaction or did you have any reaction to the, to, uh, the description in the Almada newspaper that said there was a, a Netherlands company of Cybolt, S-Y, and then cap B-O-L-T, being listed on our model list as the receiving three million in oil. Did that get your attention? Did you? Sure, sure. We, we, we looked at it and actually we were puzzled that our name uh, appeared on that list because we have not, see, uh, need, not received any oil allocation. That would also be, have very unusual, like a red tulip in the field of white tulips. Um, and that I can abso absolutely say that Sable did not buy or sell oil or, or vouchers. So it, it being one in the list of 269, I guess it, it would make us have to, whether we wanted to or not, question some of the others on that list. Would, um, in the Essex incident, which was the illegal topping off with oil, um, uh, how were the Iraqis punished or censored for this obvious illegality? How they were punished? How were they punished or censored for this, this obvious illegality? Uh, sir, I can't answer that question because that, that is beyond uh, our mandate. So, uh, so you don't know how they were punished? No, I, I, I don't know. Uh, and your my mandate, uh, it, you basically reported the incident. Uh, the, well, the, the, the incident, what happened is that a letter was sent by the, by the captain of that vessel with corresponding documents to the United Nations, clearly stipulating what happened during that event. And actually, he uh, said that this all happened after the UN inspectors left the vessel, uh, after they had completed the... Uh, and just refresh me as to how you responded. What, what we responded, when we received that letter, uh, we took immediately action. Uh, we changed immediately the working procedures and um, introduced... The seals. Uh, the seals, yeah. yeah. Could you describe the uh, Cloverly incident? The, the Cloverly incident uh, was something of an other magnitude. Uh, what happened is that uh, this vessel was nominated to load uh, in February uh, 2002. And uh, when it arrived alongside the terminal, it was very close to the expiration of the letters of credit, letter of credit which means that we- I have we no sense, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have no sense of how long a letter of credit lasts well, it, it was just a matter of days. Yeah, letters of credit give you a window of about how much. Well, I, I have to ask my... Uh, it depends on the individual letter of credit. Um, normally, the oil letters of credit would, and, and they varied, but normally it would be a period of weeks, maybe okay. four to six okay. weeks. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Box. Yeah. So uh, when that vessel arrived, we noticed, be because we kept track and record, of the uh, expiration date uh, of each individual letter of credit so that we would make sure that the completion of the vessel would fall in the, uh, into that window. Otherwise, there would be problems by, uh, I would say, drawing under the, the letter of credit to get payment for the, uh, for the uh, oil lifting. So what we did is uh, basically we uh, instructed our uh, team leader uh, to notify SOMO of this event and that loading would not be started 
until we had received from the UN oil overseers a revised, um, I would say, date or window for the letter of credit. Oh, that took obviously some time, and irrespective of that, the uh, loading master or Salmo or the Iraqi uh, people on the platform decided still, irrespective of that problem, to start loading the vessel. And luckily, we were able to get the letter of credit uh, arranged prior to the departure of the vessel. But on itself, it was uh, clearly, uh, I would say, an abuse. This is uh, for both Sabolt and Kotekna. Uh, How did the various UN offices that you work with coordinate their assistance and responses to your needs? Sorry? I'm, I'm interested to know what kind of, um, both of you have complained about confusion within the UN, sometimes uh, a lack of cooperation from the UN. Both of you have said that. I want to know how the various UN offices that you worked with coordinated their uh, interaction with you. Let me ask you this way. How many different uh, um, parts of the UN did you need to interact with? On, the, on a daily basis and for uh, technical matters, operational matters, it was only the uh, UNOIP. Okay. Uh, however, uh, when you uh, uh, negotiate a contract, or if you want to modify the uh, content of the contracts... Uh, Are you talking about your own contract? Or yes. Yes. Uh, yes. You have to deal with uh, completely different uh, departments or entities at the uh, UN. One of them is uh, the procurement department. And in fact, the, uh, uh, since uh, I negotiated and I signed two contracts and several amendments, all the technical work was done with UNOIP, but uh, all the rest, the negotiations on the uh, financial conditions, that was done with procurement department. And uh, sometimes there was a lack of coordination between the two departments, which made it difficult for a company like Cotecna to, to fully uh, and properly negotiate. And on top of that, there was uh, the Office of Legal Affairs. What affairs? Sorry, Office of Legal, Legal, Legal Affairs. Legal Affairs, yes. yes. Which was very, which is, or was in our case, a very powerful uh, department, which uh, included several very, uh, several and very tough conditions, administrative, contractual conditions in our contracts. So, in fact, uh, to operate under a contract, uh, we had to work with UNOIP, but to implement the contract, we had to deal with three separate entities. That, that was in New York. Yes. Would that describe the same challenge for you, Mr. Box? Uh, to a certain extent, uh, I, I underlined that we had similar problems with procurement. Uh, if our contract was up for renewal, uh, yeah, basically, uh, when they would not continue with us, obviously, you would need to have that information uh, uh, prior to the expiration of the contract, but sometimes uh, the amendment uh, was coming after uh, the expiration date, which gave sometimes some problems with insurers, because uh, obviously in Iraq, uh, if you want to insure yourself, uh, then you need to uh, make sure that there were reasons to be there in a sanctioned country. Uh, with OIP, I must say, I haven't had any uh, major difficulties other than that uh, we have issues where we uh, uh, ask advice after irregularities were noted, and that took sometimes uh, quite some time. Uh, the other contact points we had was with the UN oil overseers, uh, with whom we basically also on a daily basis had contact concerning the oil export. Yeah, and here and there, uh, obviously, um, delays were observed, but not to the extent uh, that it was an unworkable situation. Both of you lacked power and you lacked personnel. In other words, uh, there are just certain things you couldn't tell the Iraqis to do. Uh, wh did you try to get more power, and did you try to have your contracts revised so that you could hire more people to do the job you needed to do? Mr. Box. Shall I start? Yeah. Um, the staffing levels in the, the oil program have to a certain extent always be sufficient. 
where we faced major difficulties was in uh, monitoring the spare parts and equipment, which were also purchased under the offer food program. Uh, we, when we started, uh, we started with one inspector, uh, very modest because uh, spare parts uh, were ordered, but you're came. You're talking about parts for, for the oil industry itself. Yes, but perhaps I should elaborate a bit on it. Uh, in, uh, in 1998, the Secretary General had uh, been to Iraq and a proposal was made to change the uh, cap of uh, uh, dollars that could be generated through a, uh, a phase would be going up, up to 5.6. Greater, greater, greater production. Is the exactly. Line. So at the same time, the oil prices were very low and production was low, so Iraq was not able to uh, come up to those proceeds, uh, to come up to that cap. And then the Secretary General appointed a group of experts to go to Iraq and in consultation with the government of Iraq try to find ways of increasing production. We were uh, that group of experts and one of the conclusions as the industry was in a lamentable state is that spare parts were uh, needed and equipment was needed to bring that production up to the levels required. And for that purpose, uh, the Security Council decided that they would allow Iraq to purchase surpapets and equipment as long as there was a monitoring system that would keep track that those spare parts would also be used for their intended purpose. And so that's the area where you could have used more people? Absolutely. And did you request more people? Yeah, that was on an ongoing basis because we were facing also difficulties in terms of uh, the fact that the government of Iraq insisted that our staff would be deployed only in Baghdad and that we had to travel f throughout the country to check all those sites. Yeah. And we only had uh, at some, let's say, at the topping level, six, seven people. So the bottom line is you couldn't do the job properly with the staff that you had. Well, we had to prioritize. Okay. Um, Did this mean that you then had to take people from uh, one part of your program to put it in the other part, the spare parts? Did you have to kind of cannibalize your program? Well, from Mina Albakar and Jehan, that would, all, uh, would on itself not be uh, possible at all given the constraints in traveling. Uh, we have used, uh, in the mainly in the beginning, some stuff from Zako to do in the northern part of Iraq, also some uh, checks on uh, spare parts and equipment for a very, very short period of time, because also there the traveling was limited as we were staying in a Kurdish area, so it was difficult to travel uh, around. Let me ask you, Mr. Pruneau, um, the whole issue of the, uh, the lack of power, which you've described, and the lack of personnel, did you have both, were both of these a serious problem at various times or not? Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, respectfully, it was not really a question of having more power. The uh, specifications of our mandate were clear enough for the authentication. There was no need to get uh, further, uh, in my opinion, uh, further uh, power or physical power to implement the, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to do the work that we are doing at the, at the, on the sites. Well, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, however, the, uh, uh, sometimes because of the fluctuations in the uh, volume of goods entering Iraq, or the, uh, the fact that it was, uh, uh, that the transporters were moving from one side to the, one side to the other, made uh, uh, the work at certain sites more difficult because all of a sudden we would have thousands of, almost thousands of trucks arriving at Trebil, which was a border between Jordan and uh, Iraq. Or, uh, and especially in Umkasser, we will have uh, an accumulation of uh, uh, ships uh, unloading and the containers being, uh, uh, being st stored on the, in the port. In such a case, we would immediately try to uh, ask the UNOIP permission. In that sense, we did not have the power to move uh, at our own will as an inspector from one side to the other. The contract specified that we were requested to put a certain number of permanent inspectors on a daily basis per site, let's say 12 in, uh, in uh, Trebil. Uh, right. 
So if you want to move that and, and do that, so you, you are in, in contradiction with the obligations of the contract. So we had to ask permission and to move an inspector from one place to the other in Iraq could take a couple of days. So we would rush people to Umkasser because there was an accumulation of volume in, um, in Umkasser. I must say that uh, uh, in order to have between 54 and 67 permanent inspectors in Iraq, Kotekna had to hire 95 permanent inspectors because of the rotation and those who were sick right. or going on vacation and so on. And this would be illustrated by the statistics that are available at the uh, UN. We had more, always okay. more men, men months or men days of inspectors, especially in places like Kumkaza. For instance, we were requested to have at between 17 and 22 permanent inspectors in Umkaster, but we would have always 25, 26 well, I'm, I'm unpaid. So sometimes you simply didn't have enough people. Yes. But uh, was the solution to get more, and did you request more, and did the UN say no or yes? It was a question of negotiations and convincing the uh, uh, UNOIP that uh, it was not to increase our uh, monthly invoice that we were genuinely asking for more inspectors yeah. on the, the side. The bottom line is you don't have to worry about the UN making money off of this. I mean, their 3%, I'm assuming, help pay your costs. Is that right? Does anyone know? In other words, who, who, pay, who paid you? The UN. Uh, right. And, and they took a fee for all from oil the two point, yeah. From the 2.2 right. account. It, 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 there's nothing that we've seen so far that makes us think that uh, they didn't cover their costs plus. In other words, they made money off of this. Um, the, uh, would, would you say the UN sided more with you, your side uh, when there was a dispute with the Iraqis or the Iraqis? Did they tend to dismiss, and I'm asking both of you this, uh, this isn't a trick question, I'm just, when you, in the end of the day, did you often feel that you lost more arguments with the UN, they just more or less sided with the Iraqis, or did they more or less side with you? And I'm asking both of you. Do you understand the question? What, what, you, what you asked In other words, when you had a dispute with some transaction and you contacted the UN officials with some disappointment, were they more, did they tend more to dismiss it and just say, you know, don't worry about it? Or were they, did they take your complaint very seriously and try to deal with it? As far as Kotekna is concerned, they took it very seriously. Okay. Very seriously because they had the emissions from all the, the countries exporting to Iraq on their back. Plus, they had the suppliers calling them, and so on. And there was, until 2002, until there was... So taking it seriously means they paid attention to it. It doesn't mean they took your position, though. I mean, in other words, they realized they had something they had to deal with, so they dealt with it seriously. But, but I, don't want, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So are they, did they basically say, you all were right and they were wrong, and what was your feeling? Well, ultimately, somebody had to take a decision, and they told us to do the job with, uh, with the number of people that you have, and that's it. So we tried to uh, work under these conditions. Mr. Box? Well, and, and in terms of disputes, um, the UN would take it serious. Uh, if, if there were, we have hardly had any disputes, but we have had loadings where uh, the off-takers were uh, dissatisfied um, for one or another reason. And I must say that OIP then tried to come to a solution. Uh, not always, uh, I would say, at the end, uh, in a quick way, but at the end of the day, they, they always try to, to come and to assist. There is um, the number that is thrown out in these two sides of the equation, the, the oil for food pro program suspected that Saddam basically uh, took out 4.4 million billion, and the smuggling, which we looked at the numbers, be more like 5.7 billion. Uh, did your inspectors ever, ever identify or observe any smuggling? Although it, it, we had not the authority uh, to, to look for smuggling, and we also have to realize that our inspectors were at very remote locations, uh, in other we words, there are a lot of sites you were not at. Absolutely, more than, uh, right. than what we were. Uh, but we now have uh, had some... There, there were more sites that you weren't at than you were at. 
absolutely. Okay, is that true for you, Mr. Pruneau, as well? Well, when uh, we operated on the four or five sites, uh, we, as I explained before, we authenticated the goods which were presented to us, but there was a, a permanent flow of goods entering into Iraq, which had nothing to do with the oil for food program. Right. And I visited Iraq several times, Mr. Chairman, and it could be, it was easy to see that, uh, you know, visiting Baghdad, there was plenty of goods which should not be, have right. been on the open right. market. Okay, so in observing smuggling, if you saw it, did you report it or did you figure that wasn't uh, your responsibilities? Well, basically I can say that uh, we have had instances uh, that I felt that we had to report it. Uh, and I realized that it was outside our mandate, but still felt uh, that it had to be brought to the attention. Right. In your cases, see, uh, what's coming across is that, well, let me first, Pruno, Mr. Pruno, tell me the response to that question. When you see goods entering Iraq outside of the All for Food program, you do not know if these are the 661 goods or if these are uh, smuggled. Uh, yeah. is absolutely, uh, this was entirely left to the authority of the uh, Iraqi customs to check these goods entering Iraq. No, we would not uh, report uh, because we did not know what kind of goods these were. But, so, but in the case, uh, what I see the difference is, is that in the All for Food program, the oil part of the transaction seems to me is a little more, a little easier to have policed. But if a ship came up and loaded up, uh, that was something that you would simply step in. I mean, you weren't going to allow that kind of smuggling, correct? Well, uh, it, it, it was not always uh, ships, but at some stage, we like also could look be at a truck or we, we, we learned, uh, uh, obviously, there was traffic uh, to Jordan. Although th that was more or less, uh, I think, a, an acceptable phenomena, and we have reported in our fact-finding missions uh, that volumes uh, were estimated uh, uh, at 80,000 barrels a day. Uh, but we also have seen the, uh, uh, the fact that Gorda uh, Maya had been used in the early 2003, and we reported that to uh, both the multilateral inter interception force as well as the United Nations. So there would be some ships, though, that you would not have inspected, correct? Sure. Uh, when they were loaded at a different terminal, we would not have um, staff available to do that. Well, I mean, you know, that's kind of significant. <laughs> um, how many terminals were you at versus how many terminals exist? Well, you had um, not only terminals. Uh, we have to uh, make a distinction here. You have the pipeline to Syria. Uh, you have trucks to Turkey, trucks to Jordan. You had vessels uh, in the Arabian Gulf, uh, which were loaded at the Shat al Arab, which basically the multilateral interception force had looked at. And we had uh, also uh, a terminal 10 kilometers north of Mina al Bakr called Ghor al Amaya. Uh, those were, um, I would say, the, the, the points. Uh, that, that activity has been observed, not by us, but by others. Why didn't Cotecna uh, operate inspection sites in neighboring countries as Sabo did? Now, let me say it again. Uh, Sabo had inspection sites in neighboring countries. Is that correct, Mr. Box? Uh, we had uh, like in one Turkey. inspection site in Turkey. Right. And why, why were you in Turkey? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Iraq had, uh, from the beginning onwards, two export points, uh, one in the, in the south, Min Al-Bakr, we talked about. But the, the crude oil, which was produced in the north, was transshipped through, uh, through the Iraq-Turkey pipeline to Chehan. And in Chehan, there was a terminal, there is a terminal, where that crude oil is stored and loaded subsequently in vessels which then proceed through the Mediterranean. Now, why wouldn't you have been in Syria then? If you were in Turkey, why wouldn't you have been in Syria? Well, that is an interesting question. I can't answer that. Um, that is not up to me. It's beyond. No, no, no I, I understand. It's not up to you. But, but um, the same logic that would apply that you should be in Turkey would apply, correct, that you should be in Syria as well, correct? Correct. Uh, it, um, we discussed that also uh, at some states uh, with, with, with OIP that uh, whether there could be coming a mandate to uh, inspect also the, the Syrian part, but it was obviously up to the, the Security <coughs> Council.
Um, so, um, and, and their response was? Well, again, that there was no mandate. Obviously, uh, Iraq has uh, sub subsequently said that they were testing the pipeline. Well, I mean, that's absurd. I mean, I mean what we're basically saying is that we, we, there was a very viable pipeline through Syria, very pi viable pipeline through Turkey. We were inspecting the, the pipeline through Turkey, and we were not inspecting the pipeline through Syria. Correct. And, and I just would like to have a sense of why. And they had to give you some answer. Yeah, it, it, it is uh, an interesting subject. But having said that, if we would not have the authority, we couldn't do it. And the authority had to come I, from the council. Let me just say this to you. You are cleared of all responsibility. So you can relax. But what you're doing is you're educating a committee. I want to know what they would have said. I mean, it's, it's a rather poor system that would I mean, I've wondered how the smuggling could happen. And I didn't realize that we made it so easy. So when you, you must have had just general conversations with the UN officials, did they give you a logical reason as to why we wouldn't want you also to be in Syria. Uh, what, what I heard is that it has been discussed uh, also uh, merely uh, during uh, meetings of the 661 committee, and there was no agreement reached as to how to proceed on and, that. Uh, and, and agreement required a, a unanimous consent. It's kind of like the Senate in Washington, um, which doesn't give me any comfort. Um, <laughs> We're almost done here, gentlemen, and thank you very much. How often, uh, Mr. Pruneau, did goods avoid or ignore the authentication or inspection process? How often did you actually inspect goods? I, I, I get the feeling, given your mandate, given your personnel, that when ships lined up, when trucks lined up, you were more inspecting the paperwork than actually opening up, opening up the containers. Yes, we had the, the mandate to uh, match the documents and to authenticate. Now, there are two things in your question. Uh, but that, no, that is your mandate. Your mandate was to match the papers, not, not verify that the paper, what was in the containers, verified the papers. It, it was left to our position as professional as a inspection company to inspect, which means to open, for instance, the containers right. or to open the, the trucks, talking of uh, the, the land uh, border sites. Now, in such a case, normal practice is about uh, uh, two percent, sometimes five, six percent, maximum five, six percent. What we did was on an average basis, rather than 10% of the number of uh, trucks or containers being presented to us were opened. And I have provided some pictures right. to illustrate this. But, but candidly, when there was the queuing up and a backlog, there, put, there, was put, there was more pressure on you. Then the trucks would wait. No. The trucks would wait. Yeah. The trucks would wait. The, the, the drivers are educated. I mean, uh, patience is a, uh, is a virtue in the Middle East, and they, ju they would just wait at the border. Patience is a virtue. <laughs> True. Yeah, so, so I can infer from that that when there was pressure, um, when, I, when there was pressure to uh, a backlog, that did not, that did not impact you, your, uh, the, the quality of the work. No. Well, here's the, um, here's the general feeling I get from uh, w w your testimony. And, and I want you to tell me whether you agree or disagree. Um, Mr. Smith, uh, I get the sense that BNP basically uh, believed, uh, and I'm not passing judgment on this, I'm just saying what I believe, that your responsibility was to check documents. Uh, you were basically 
Iraq's bank, uh, selected by the UN, correct? We were the UN's bank, in our opinion, okay. maintaining an account for the UN, which was styled the Okay, the Iraq called, and I'm happy you're correcting me. You were the UN's bank for Iraq, um, for Iraqi transactions. That's right. Uh, dollars came in from the sale of oil, and dollars flowed out for the purchase of commodities. And that your responsibility was to not uh, was to to make sure that, and you were giving letters of credit to make sure that this could all happen. But ultimately, you, your your responsibility was to make sure that the paperwork matched. Is that a fair uh, assessment of, of of what I've heard you say? Our responsibility was to ensure that all of the paperwork was in accordance with the letters of credit before we made any payments. Right. The, the one additional point I would add in there, that not all of the funds that were received for the, um, the sale of the oil were retained at BNP Paribas. Um, a minimum of 41%, as I explained in my, my opening statement, was transferred away um, to another bank, the, the UN's main bank, Chase Manhattan, uh, because BNP Paribas was only involved in the part of the humanitarian program that affected the central and southern provinces of Iraq. So the uh, Kurdish area was not? The Kurdish area was within the funds that we, we moved to Chase Manhattan. Gotcha, okay. Uh, and you couldn't verify, uh, as long as your paperwork matched, um, then, then, then the transactions took place. Yes, basically okay. we were making payment against the, the letter of credits okay. that we had issued on the UN's behalf. Okay. And with you, Mr. Box, and, and you, Mr. Pruno, what I, what I sense is a, a, a different challenge. With you, Mr. Pruno, uh, you had lots of different commodities um, to, uh, to check. Uh, you had uh, you had ports, plus you had you had four transaction transaction points. Yeah, uh, you were inspecting trucks, you were inspecting ships, um, but you were primarily uh, processing paper. You weren't um, taking uh, a, a good look at every um, every. You, you weren't able to verify. Uh, whether or not the paperwork matched what was actually uh, potentially in, in, in a ship or in a truck. Is that correct? We were, able, we were able to do that. Sometimes, as I mentioned before, there were pressures in, uh, because of the volumes or for uh, outside uh, reasons, like uh, the Iraqis uh, trying to put pressure on us. But uh, no, we, uh, we had a, a blending of uh, uh, IT technicians. The, the operations that we carried was a combination of uh, physical inspections, as I said, 10 percent, or systematic sampling of uh, foodstuffs. Yeah, it was sampling of, of the of the food cargo. Stuff. It was a sample of, of it. Of correct? the food yeah. of, of the food basket only. Okay. And uh, for which we had to, to do 100 percent uh, laboratory analysis. But it was a combination, as I said, of uh, uh, physical inspections matching documents and keying, receiving and keying data and processing these data and these documents and sending them to New York. So the, uh, the, the, the site was busy 24 hours per day. But your testimony before the committee was you didn't have enough people to do your job. On a case by case basis, not on a permanent basis. Yeah. And that was especially, and as it's mentioned in my testimony, it was especially at Umkasser in 2001. Right. And that as a request, as, as a result, sorry, uh, there was a, uh, an increase. I believe when we were operating in Umkasser at, uh, in, when there was this uh, peak, at the end of 2000, 2001, at the beginning of 2001, we, we had a total of uh, uh, 62, uh, or, no, 57 permanent inspectors, and that was the, the following contract, which, we, which was uh, won again by us, uh, uh, covered an additional five inspectors from for Umkasser. And in both cases, neither of you were at all the sites that you needed to be. 
in order to see all transactions, which enabled smuggling to take place. Uh, that was not our duty. I mean, uh, no, no, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's your yeah. duty. I'm just saying that you were not at all the potential sites of transaction, either for oil or for commodities. Is that correct? All the all the five eight six all the all four food transactions crossed the border, and we all authenticated them. What's that? All transactions under the oil for food program crossed the border those which crossed the border, and we authenticated them. Right. There was nothing else for us to do than just to look at the uh, uh, for Yeah, you, you only looked for the oil for food transactions. Yes, absolutely. All the other transactions you did not look at. No, we did not know. Yeah, and, uh, and that's the case with you, Mr. Box. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, we were at the authorized export points, yeah. and uh, yeah, th th that was about it. Okay. I'm sorry to keep you here a little longer, but I just need to ask you this one other area. When he undersold his oil, did you have any responsibilities to deal with that issue? In other words, were there questions raised when he would sell oil for below market price? Because the UN approved it, that was good enough? In other words, I mean, uh, any thinking person would wonder how, why would he s undersell for oil? Did that raise questions in your mind? He undersold his oil. He sold it for a price below market. We are obviously, we be, uh, didn't have anything to do with the uh, uh, transfers of money. Pricing was not uh, a factor. With you, our just, you just looked at volume. When he overpaid for commodities, uh, you didn't look at pricing either, so. No. So, Not at all. Okay. Let me conclude by asking you, each of you, which is the weakness of the program? Um, which is the, what was the greatest weakness of the program? Tell me, each of you, what you think the greatest weakness in the program from your perspective. I'll start with you, Mr. Smith. If you were designing the program, what would you have designed differently? To make sure as there weren't the ripoffs that we know took place. As I said in my opening statement, from a banking perspective, I think the structure was right. Um, from the program as a whole, more control was required over the procurement process and the pricing process. And Mr. Box? Yeah, that, that is something I can't comment on, but I would say that um, the unauthorized export points, uh, Syria came online, obviously, at a much later stage than uh, the inception of the program. But I think that is obviously uh, a shame that it happened. Thank you. M Mr. Purnell? Well, Cotecna has uh, contracts worldwide for uh, the control of, uh, of borders and especially provide services to the customs of various countries in the world. When I say provide, it means really sometimes we replace the customs or we uh, control the customs. Now, the uh, oil for food program and the authentication was something totally different, as I mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, if a uh, comprehensive program had, be, had been designed, even for the oil for food program, it should have covered, or it could have covered, the various uh, sectors of a complete control of imports, which is uh, the price verification, the quality, quantity, and so on. But that was not, the re that was not requested in our mandate. Right. You all have been extraordinarily patient, and I think you've changed your schedules, and you've had to state later uh, than, than even I thought would happen. And you have been very cooperative with us. You've tried to be, I think, extraordinarily helpful, uh, which is a credit to, to all three of you and to your companies, and I thank you for that. Is there anything that you want to put on the record before we adjourn, anything that you think needs to be on the record before we adjourn? All set? Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank this you. hearing is adjourned.
Next, the Foreign Minister of Libya speaks to the United Nations. Later,